Hello, son. Sometimes you just want to relax and meditate. In tonight's compilation, I'll talk about some strange, weird, and scary horror stories that will put you asleep. So without further ado, thank you for your support and enjoy. It was just another day on the job for police officer Andrew as he set out to check a local crack house and arrest any drug dealers he might find. He brought his trusty canine companion along with him as they made their way deep into the woods, close to the National Park. The weather was dark and rainy, adding to the eerie atmosphere of the already abandoned and dilapidated building. As he approached the crack house, Andrew shone his flashlight on the door, knocking several times before realizing there was no one inside. He then proceeded to force the door open, letting himself and his dog inside. But as soon as he stepped through the threshold, he knew something was off. The house was empty, not a single soul or drug in sight. But then, on a third floor, he saw something that made his blood run cold. It was a ghost, or at least, that's what it looked like. It was tall and angry, letting out a blood-curdling screech as it lunged towards him. Andrew tried to defend himself, pulling out his gun and firing several shots. But they had no effect on the ghost-like figure. His dog, sensing the danger, tried to attack the ghost, but it was to no avail. The dog just flew through the ghost and fallen of the window, dying in a matter of seconds. Panicking Andrew ran out of the crack house and back to the safety of his patrol car. He radioed for backup, but no one believed his story of a ghost in the woods. They thought he was just imagining things, or worse, making it up. But Andrew knew what he saw, and it haunted him for weeks to come. He couldn't shake the image of the ghost-like figure from his mind, and he couldn't help but wonder if it was still out there, lurking in the woods, waiting for its next victim. Andrew never went back to that crack house, and the area was forever abandoned, avoided by both the police and the locals. But some say on a dark and rainy night, if you listen closely, you can still hear the ghost screech echoing through the woods. It was a sunny and windy day when I, Lincoln, a park ranger, set out on my patrol. I had been on the job for a few years now and had, had seen my fair share of strange things, but nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to encounter. As I trekked through the dense woods, the wind whipping through the trees, I suddenly caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye. I turned to investigate and was met with the sight of a cabin, one that wasn't on any map. My curiosity peaked. I made my way towards the cabin. Upon arrival, I found the cabin to be empty, but upon further inspection, I discovered a map with a red cross mark on it. I couldn't understand why anyone would mark this particular spot, but my excitement got the better of me, and I decided to follow the map to see where it would lead me. As I followed the map, the woods around me grew denser and darker. The sun began to set, casting long shadows across the forest floor. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, but I shrugged it off as my imagination getting the best of me. But then I saw it, a creature unlike any I'd ever seen before. It was huge, standing at least eight feet tall with shaggy fur covering its body. Its eyes were a piercing yellow and its mouth was filled with razor sharp teeth. It was a werewolf, there was no denying it. The creature let out a deafening roar and lunged toward me. I barely managed to avoid its attack, but the creature was quick and agile. It chased after me as I ran, my heart pounding in my chest. I had never been so scared in my life. Finally, after an unsuccessful attack, the creature retreated into the woods, leaving me standing there panting and confused. I had no idea what to make of what had just happened. I had never believed in werewolves or any other mythical creature, but now I knew they were real. I reported back to my supervisors, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was hallucinating or making the whole thing up. But I knew what I had seen, and I knew that it was real. That day changed my life forever. I couldn't shake the memory of that creature and the fear that it instilled in me. It was like a nightmare that I couldn't escape from. I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there watching me, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. 
I couldn't stay in the woods after that. I had to quit my job. Now I'm haunted by the memory of the creature, and I'm afraid it will come for me again. I can't sleep at night, and I'm always looking over my shoulder. I know that it's still out there, and I fear that one day it will find me. That's my story, the story of how I encountered a werewolf deep in the woods. I know it sounds crazy, but it's the truth, and I pray that no one else has to go through what I did, because if they do, they may not survive. When I was little, my cousins and I were camping in a treehouse in the Apalachicola National Forest, northern Florida. The treehouse was about 50 yards from an old swamp. We had an old dog that always followed us around and kept us company when playing in the woods. He couldn't get into the tea house due to the steep ladder being the only access, so he just hung out under the tea. As it started getting late in the evening, we started telling ghost stories to try and scare one another. All of a sudden, we hear this big splash coming from the swamp behind us. We all laugh, thinking it was our dog going for a late-night swim. The next thing we hear is a horrific scream that sounded like a woman being murdered. At the end of the scream, there's a low growling sound, and we all freeze. There was nothing we could do, and nowhere to run. The treehouse had an opening in the floor and no door. We start to hear something scratching and crawling at the ladder. We all jump up and go to the farthest point from the entrance. The next thing we see is our dog's head pop up as he struggled to get into the treehouse. He had climbed a ladder that was near 90 degrees to get away from whatever was below. My cousin ran to him and dragged him into the room. We all were silent once again and hear something rustling around and walking circles around the tree. After a few minutes, we hear another splash and the animal swimming away. It was the first time I had heard a cougar scream, and I'll never forget it. At Grundy Provencal Park, Ontario, just pulled into our site, freshly arrived, ready for a stretch after a long drive. I climbed out, and so did my great Dane. Turned around, and a big black bear who was brown, walked out of the trees two feet from me carrying a candle in a pot from the campsite next to us. I easily could have touched it. I'm whisper yelling to my husband to not let the kids out of the car as I try to stay still and get my dog out of the path. That mother F just waddled past me, not even bothering to look at me, thank God. Well, I nearly passed out. My idiot of a dog never even noticed the freaking bear. She would not survive on her own. The thing is, I've run into bears before, on a campsite and while hiking, but I was mentally prepared. This time I was not as we had been in the park for what felt like 30 seconds. I was shook, was ready to turn around immediately and go home without unpacking. Only time I've ever felt that way on a camping trip. I read my campsite neighbors, the riot act about bear safety and scented freaking candles. Needless to say, the trip was doomed from. The start as my Dane got diarrhea in the night a few days later and paced circles around the tent, spreading it everywhere. I did get to see more of the bears at the laundry area while washing everything in the tent, and I didn't freak out those times. We have had a few scare animal encounters, but have to carry a friend out of a canine that was have a heat stroke. We were in a big group that had broken apart as it was a long hike. My son and I got to our friend, and he did not look good. I sent my son ahead to camp for help and to get supplies to keep him alive ready. I also did not want him to see how bad it was. It was a grueling two miles up where I ended up strapping him to my back with my backpack and rope then just climbing. Once getting him to camp, we had to work hard and keep him alive. We were in a very remote area where you are warned that no one will rescue you, and you are on your own. We were so lucky he did not die. Small group of friends camping in the woods down a forest road that has public dispersed camping spots. While we were asleep in our tents, a car playing loud music pulled just past our spot and pulled off the road. 
The music woke us up and we could hear someone get out of the car. All of a sudden a gunshot goes off, then another, then another, then rapid fire 27 more shots. My girlfriend and my dog are obviously terrified, so I grab my handgun and put my pants on, then slowly poke my head out of the tent. Then, as I'm creeping out of the tent, I ran to a tree and peered around it. The car is still there, and I can barely see two people next to it as it's pitch black out at 3 a.m. They were roughly 50 feet from my friend's tent, and a vehicle with two other friends inside it. I creep over to my buddy's vehicle and I knock on the window to say my buddy's name and don't shoot me. Then he opens the door and we try to figure out what the hell to do. He pokes his head out and yells, don't shoot. We have guns. Get the hell out of here. We see that the two individuals finally notice we are extremely close. and They hop in the car, pull back and drive away down the forest road. We call the cops and all hop in one car drive back into town and we go to Denny's where we try to figure out what the F just happened. A couple hours later we get a call from the cops and they say they were unable to find this car but they have multiple vehicles looking. They tell us we are all good to go back to our campsite. Obviously the six of us plus my dog are in no shape to go back and sleep in our tents. We hang out until sunrise and then go back. We find the 30 empty 7.62 shells, and we see they were shooting essentially parallel with our camp, and it was under 75 feet away. In 2008, I was camping with friends on the Wisconsin River between Boscobel and Wyalusing. It rained so much Lake Delton overflowed and spilled into the Wisconsin River, taking houses, trees, and everything else in its path. With it, there was so much rain they'd opened all 13-ish dams along the Wisconsin River, far, far, far upstream. We didn't have great cell phones back in 2008, so we didn't know most of this until the water went up 10-plus overnight on our second night. There was no exit option other than ride down to Wyalusing for our livery. We quite literally rode through obstacles like portions of houses and trees that at times were full grown but washed down. There was one bridge we barely made it under due to all the other debris. When we got to the Mississippi River to turn towards Wyalusing, I knew we were in trouble when I didn't see a single boat or jet ski on the river. What's normally a bustling highways of boat traffic was empty. I could see white cap waves going upstream on the old mist. We bunged all the gear on the canoes best we could, put on our life jackets and towed the mile or so we needed to, to the area we'd be picked up. It was pretty horrifying trying to navigate a full canoe through waves like that. We were lucky. One of the other boats wasn't, and then they tipped they lost a ton of their camping gear. They made it to safety, but barely. The entire group of friends loves to tell the story when we're having beers, but I swore I never wanted to wring out my sleeping bag and sleep wet like that again. Every trip down the Wisconsin River after that was done in August instead of June. I was camping in the middle of nowhere, and this car keeps getting closer and closer. It's pitch black, middle of the night, and this car's headlights are on, way off the road. Eventually, the car stops like 25 feet from my sight. I'm set up behind a bush, and I can tell they don't know I'm there. I decide the best thing to do is make contact so things don't get even more weird. This dude was drunk as F and even more startled to see me. I scared the shit out of him, and he was clearly armed. Luckily, he just apologized and went on his drunken way. Humans are way scarier than anything else out there. Three years ago, I reserved a hike. An only campground in Marin Headlands, north of San Francisco. It took about an hour and a half to walk up there. It was very beautiful, but very desolate. It was just me. I got up there before nightfall and pitched my little tent. There were no other campers there. I enjoyed the beautiful sunset and went to bed. 
Sometime during the night I woke up because I heard a noise coming from the trees about ten yards behind the campsite. It sounded like a larger animal walking through underbrush very slowly, occasionally stopping. I tried to stay calm but quickly realized that whatever it was was approaching my tent. Then a few feet away the footsteps stopped completely. After a few more moments I heard a noise right outside my tent that I will never forget. It was a very low but very distinctly sad, mournful sound. It sounded exactly like a quiet human moan. I was instantly totally paralyzed with terror. I did not move and I barely even breathed, let alone ask who was there. I knew I had no cell phone service up there and I would not have moved a muscle to pick up my phone, even if I did have service. I'm not religious, but I did pray for whatever it was to leave me alone. I don't know how much time passed before it left, but it did. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I remained motionless in my tent until the first bit of light and then quickly packed my stuff and ran back down to the parking lot, got in my car and drove back to the city. I have not camped alone since then. Scariest thing to happen to me was while I was camping at Martin River Provincial Park. While I was sleeping in my pop-up trailer, I heard what sounded like a young woman screaming in the woods. It started to be sporadic, screaming, moving through the bush, and eventually started coming closer. It sounded like it was about 30 feet away, and still sounded exact like a screaming woman or child. I was too damn scared to try to find the zipper for the window, so I waited. Right as I was sitting up to unzip the window, the scream came from directly below my pullout. I couldn't hear any footsteps and didn't know how it got there or if it was gone, so I just laid still for what felt like hours. I eventually got up to look and couldn't even see any tracks. My guess is it was Cougar or some other cat that was in heat. One, 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 one. We had the fire nearly run out of wood and it was a very dark and late night. So there was really no use for me and my drunk buddy to gather some while our girlfriend slept. We decided to finish the last six beers and talk about random things before bed. I got up to take a leak and when I pulled out my flashlight I caught a damn skunk about two steps away from me. I backed up as quick as possible, but it was obviously annoyed at nearly being stepped on by some drunken midwestern guy with his unit halfway out. Close call and not that scary considering that could have ended a lot worse. My wife, Dog, and I were backpacking on the AT in Vermont. At about five in the morning, we heard something moving around outside our tent and the dog started this low growling. I peeked out and could see a large shape moving around. And first, I thought it was a bear. The dog kept growling, but it was that afraid, I'm going to hide behind you, sort of growl. The shape moved closer, and I realized it wasn't a bear, but a cow moose. She came right up to the tent and looked inside. At this point, the dog was done and ducked behind me. Make it go away, my wife whimpered. I thought, how the hell am I going to make a 1,000-pound moose go away? But she eventually wandered off. Poor location choice to set up my tent during a storm on a solo trip. Kayaked my gear across a lake to a remote location. Set up in an area that was relatively dry at the time. Woke up in the middle of the night to my tent being in about eight inches of rushing water. Waded through thigh deep rushing water to the beach to make sure my kayak was still there. It was. But I dragged it up to higher ground to be sure went back to my tent and dragged it as far back as I could out of the water. I had a tree in my way, so I could only move it by five, six feet or so. Then I started to dig a trench to divert water and stack rocks to act as a dam. Woke up every 40 minutes or so to check on the water. By the time I got out of bed in the morning, the water had risen back to my tent, just barely touching it. Packed up my soaking wet tent and kayaked one hour back to where I'd parked. And wouldn't you know it, the sun had come out, the water was calm and clear. It turned out to be a beautiful day. 
but with a wet tent, my three-night trip was cut short to one. Don't cheap out on your tents, people. All my gear inside stayed bone dry. I was camping alone, just laid down and was starting to snooze when I heard this sound through the bush. I didn't think anything of it, really. It's a popular campground. Well, this sound is coming from the bush and it's heavy footsteps. The kind where you can hear the impact of the step. And I'm thinking, oh, this guy is bushwhacking low. Then I start thinking, oh shit, he's really bushwhacking. Why? There's a trail right there. And then my sleepy brain wakes up and goes, oh, it's a F Sasquatch. And I start freaking out. I sleep with a large knife and axe, so I'm griping them, just laying there, all quiet, listening to this thing crash. It's way through the bush, right beside my tent. It's dark, so I can't even look out the window without using a flashlight. So I just lay there, listening, thinking this Sasquatch is gonna rip into my little tent. Then I start thinking, oh, it's not a Sasquatch, it's a bear. Did I shit you? Not my heart went from crazy beats jumping out of my chest to calm in an instant. Somehow a real live bear is less scary than a Sasquatch. I even heard it rattling the garbage cans and everything. It was pretty crazy for wildlife that night. Right after the bear passed a large elk or deer came charging through my campsite. Scared the shit out of me. Must have been spooked by my Sasquatch. Earlier this year, I was camping on the Clyde River in upstate New York. It's dark. I'm in my tent trying to sleep, watching fireflies overhead. Out of nowhere, they're splashing. I'm only about 10 or 15 feet from the riverbank, and the splashing sounds like something big is climbing out of the river. My heart starts pounding, and I'm certain that a bear or a moose or something has just swum across the river and chosen my campsite as the exact place it wants to climb out. I hunker down in my tent, terrified, and praying it doesn't decide to investigate. I'm clutching my utility knife to my chest. Like that would do much against a bear, and I'm doing my best to keep my breathing quiet. The splashing doesn't stop. One, two minutes, maybe three. The water's still splashing. I start to panic, thinking maybe an entire family of bears is coming out of the river. When I eventually realize there's no animal sounds, snorting or pawing, etc., to be heard, I manage to swallow my fear long enough to peek out of my tent. It was just wake from a passing boat. I'm a dumbass. I wasn't entirely alone, though, because a raccoon did steal my leftovers about a half hour later. Went backpack camping with my slightly older, also female cousin in the mountains in Virginia. Took over an hour to get up to the only parking lot with access to the trailhead due to the road being more potholes than road. A lone car accompanied us in said parking lot. On our hike in, we passed a couple of fellow backpackers heading back to the car. We saw, so we knew as long as nobody else arrived after us. We were alone on that side of the mountain. Encountered a huge rattler laying in the middle of the trail that my cousin's Irish wolfhound decided to investigate and got bit on the nose. He was fine, but it was a bit alarming. Got our sight set up appropriately, hung food far away. Lots of firewood for the night, sub-freezing bags, etc. Had a great evening exploring and appreciating the beauty. I fell asleep relatively easy, given all the work we had put in to ensure we were well set up. My cousin wakes me up with reoccurring jabs to the ribs low. Did you hear that? She was whispering. No tiff, I was sleeping. What did you hear? She shushed me and said there was something outside of our tent. My being a fatalist and all decided I was more interested in going back to sleep than I was with whatever was prowling around our site. It was 2 a.m., probably a raccoon or a possum. Bring it on, bucko. I was about to put the earplugs I had brought in my ears when the most peculiar vocalization I had ever heard rang out. It sounded unnatural, almost like a computer-generated sound. It was loud, 
sounded like a mix between a turkey call and cadence, almost a gobble but high-pitched and warning in nature like a big cat screech. I've spent so many nights in the deep woods and have never heard anything close to that sound. I put my earplugs back in, relegated to the fact that we were probably goners. Didn't hear anything else while we were up there. Didn't see any other campers either. Upon our departure, we went into the little town at the bottom of the mountain and hit up the market. Asked the locals about the call we heard, while feeling ridiculous attempting to mimic the call and finally ran into a couple of old farmers who told us how lucky we were to hear what we heard. I guess whatever it is and the sound it makes is a highly sought-after experience, although they couldn't definitively identify what the responsible creature was. We went home and searched online for hours for a sound bite that could help us out. Nothing came close. Super frustrating. I can still hear it and wish there was a way to recreate it so someone might be able to help identify what the heck it was. I was tent camping in Revelstoke two summers ago and a massive windstorm came through just before the sun was about to go down. The campground had a ton of tall skinny birch trees. My dog partner at the time and I were sitting around the fire trying to deal with the wind and all of a sudden start hearing loud bangs one after another. Then a couple of screams. Turns out the birch trees were snapping and falling onto people's tents slash trailers slash vehicles. Because the sun was just about to set, it was extremely difficult to see much, making the entire situation extremely dangerous. Certain parts of the campground were evacuated but where I was camped, a tree had fallen across the road, so we were told by park staff to shelter in place and try our best to keep our eyes open. The storm eventually passed, but the next morning when we woke up and saw the magnitude of damage the storm had caused, it was extremely unnerving. Our neighbors had a tree land within two feet of their trailer. Otherwise, the trip was great, though. Ten of ten, Revel Stoke. Camping in dispersed camping spots along a small river. We had camped here many times and understood the spacing of campsites along the river. We were parked in the one pullout along the road, which was a big indication that someone is camping there. That didn't matter to the other party. They packed in two tables and covered them with bottles of liquor, just about ten yards from us. Once we went to bed, there was an argument on the road up above and one single gunshot. The night was silent after, and we never heard anything again. In the morning, there were people sleeping in cars, toilet paper all over the ground. It was a mess, but silent. Super weird. I was hiking solo in the winter of 2017 in the Canangra Boyd National Park southwest of Sydney, Australia. After a full day of hiking in roughly 25 kilometers from my car, in the nearest road and the sun is getting low in the sky, I started looking for a clearing to set up camp for the night. I'd slung my pack to the ground and had started pulling out my gear when I caught a large black mass out of the corner of my eye, moving slowly through the bush about 50 meters off to my left. Standing up slowly, I had to walk a few paces to get a clear view, and to my shock, there stood an emaciated black horse staring back at me. Needless to say, I wasn't keen on having to share my serenity with this untamed demon horse. So I scooped up my gear, and I was off to find another spot for the evening. Here's where it gets creepy. As I started walking again, so too did the horse. It flanked me step for step about 50 meters off my left-hand side for another couple of kilometers. If I stopped, it would stop. If I stepped towards it, it would step away from me. If I jogged, it would trot to keep pace, but always flanking my left side. Twilight was settling, and it was clear that my new demon horse buddy wasn't leaving. I built a decent fire and decided to use my descending rope and a few trees to create an ad hoc fence encircling my tent and fire. The night descends into the kind of blackness that only comes with a new moon. 
Oddly, I sleep like a baby and had forgotten about the horse until I stuck my head out of my tent and see the rope I'd strung up the night before. Restoking my fire back to life, I look over and see the horse laying dead in the exact spot it had been the night before, an emaciated sack of black matted hairy skin full of bones. It was like it had been dead for weeks. When I was a Boy Scout, I did this camping trip where you hike five miles in and set up camp. After getting settled, we watched these dark clouds roll in. Our leader called us over to tell us we were in a tornado warning and that we should be prepared to leave. It escalated quickly. Radio said we had a tornado touchdown less than 10 miles away and they called in two vans to come get us. Rain that came down flooded the area so bad that the vans got stuck. The wind was picking up, and the rain was even worse. Radio said the tornado was getting closer to you, so our leader told us to drop everything and run. I was never scared of storms, but running through heavy rain. Lighting strikes that were less than a mile away from you, where you could feel the pressure and static, not knowing where everyone was or really where to go, because it was so dark and the rain was so torrential. It was terrifying. Been camping a lot since then, and noises in the dark don't bother me, but storms are something else. The date was January 10, 2021. It was a cold night with a slight fog outside my hometown of Tunkhannock in northeast Pennsylvania. Many nights I like to take long walks in order to clear my mind from the busy day. I walked on the rural road by this large patch of woods not far from my home. On my right is an old building with two small wooden houses beside it. As I'm looking, I notice movement. Then I see an eight to ten foot pale white figure briskly walk across the road from one of the houses to the woods about fifty feet from me. I know I saw something, so I quickly continue forward. Whatever it was, I wanted nothing to do with it, and I now wanted to get home as fast as possible. A minute or two later, I look up. Again, I see this pale figure that is now on all fours, but still five feet tall at the shoulder. It is about 100 feet in the woods to the left of me. It had bleached white skin, a bald head, and huge black eyes. It had a human face and body, except it looked extremely emaciated, and in its arms were like super long. It started to sway its body back and forth like a mantis. This is when I ran as fast as I could. I only looked back after I ran for a solid five minutes, and I don't believe it had chased me. I was very close to home, and I was concerned that this pale humanoid was lurking about so near to where I live. I have no idea what I saw, but I know that it was real, not an apparition. I know that you have written a book about these pale humanoids, and I wonder if this may be what you described as a crawler. Thanks. Not my story, but actually a friend of mine who's a ranger, also fisherman, and has been in the woods, lakes and mountains of the northwest since he was at least five or six. He is an expert tracker and woodsman and lifelong outdoorsman. He's never really been scared of anything in the woods. He is an expert with a sidearm and also prides himself in having a black belt and a kettle. He has no fear or hesitation about any situation, especially in the woods, but he has seen some weird stuff, but nothing to make him hesitate, let alone fear. So this is a story he told me and has given me full permission to share with you. One day late afternoon, he was on a solo camp out in this Cascade foothills, about an hour or so drive from Seattle. He had been fishing a favorite creek, then hiking clear around the base of a tall mountain, then back to his camp. It was late afternoon, the light was beginning to fade, and he was starting to get ready to cook his dinner. He heard a noise off to his left on a game trail that went down to the side of the mountain and back to a creek. He turned around and saw a large, hairy biped, walking on two legs, moving quickly away from him down the trail. He could see that it was making a deep rumbling noise, almost like it had a cold or a really bad wet sinus cough, as he described it. 
It had long or dark brown black hair and was huge, easily seven feet tall, if not larger, and very wide shoulders, big arms, and long legs. He claims it did not look like a bear, but it, it did look like a big, hairy, giant ape. But he said it moved quickly off, and he never saw it at least that fully again. He thought it was a bear until later, when he was making camp, he found a young doe carcass. But the carcass was ripped apart, no real blood on the carcass or the ground. He said it reminded him of a grizzly kill, but the legs were twisted backwards. He said it looked like a bear kill, but that it looked like something had twisted the legs to change the way the deer's body was positioned. It disturbed him the kill is also fresh and no more than a day or two old. He had a small fire going, and it was now getting dark. He had his pistol out and was looking around. Then he almost heard a swap noise behind him. He turned around and sees these big dark red eyes, like cat's eyes in the tree above his head. He said it looked like the eyes were on a large scale, like the way a bird's eyes are. But it was red, not yellow. He said it was more similar to that of a cat's eyes because it was the size. He said it had to have been at least ten feet off the ground between him and this thing. He'd been there for only about an hour, and he never noticed these eyes before. He couldn't really see any shape behind the eye, but in a spot where there's likely no perch to have a bird. It was just staying there without moving. He said it was on the same side as the tree is the game trail, where earlier he saw the big hairy biped walking. He had no desire to make eye contact for very long, so he turned his back on this red eye and went back to making dinner. He said he wanted to exit the situation and did not want to stare into these eyes in case he was trying to communicate with him. He heard a low rumbling growl from behind him. Something hit his tent, then left. He said it hit the tent hard enough to shake it, and he heard footsteps like something running away fast. He knew at this point it wasn't a bear or any other normal animal in the woods because had they been doing this, he would have known exactly what they were. He somehow stayed calm and remained as calm as he could. He said he had a hard time falling asleep, but when he finally fell asleep, he was awakened by the thing growling, grunting, and making a deep rattling noise like it had a cold, and he said you could smell it too. He described it as a fecal, sweaty, rotten, cheese skunk smell. It was terrible. When he reflects back on this, he believes this thing got more and more aggressive gradually because it would not leave his territory, but he's uncertain because at the time he didn't feel any fear of this big hairy biped, that it was angry. It woke him up at about 2.30 in the morning, and he said it left again, making the noise, and after that he never saw, ever heard it again. Once daylight came, he went to check out the area where he saw it the night previous. He said there were two different trails in the area, and they intersected at the spot where he saw the two red eyes the night before. He said it was the same side where he found the dead deer, which was now missing the dead doe carcass. He said the trail was similar to that of a game trail, but it looked more like a person had cleared it, which was probably not possible since he was kind of way out there, and this is when he was able to get a more accurate measure of where the eyes were on the tree. He said it was easily probably about ten feet up, means whatever was watching him was standing right behind the large tree. He had zero desire to meet whatever this was at that point, so he decided enough was enough and to pack his things and leave. He said that he was not a believer before the encounter, but now he definitely is. He doesn't see any way that it could have been a hoax or a mistake or misidentification. Remember, he's been in the woods a long time and has spent much time in the outdoors. He's anybody who should have a respectable opinion and enough to know that he's an expert. And now that he's getting a little older, he doesn't go into the woods as much anymore and also retired as a park ranger for the time being. I'm an officer here in the Philippines. I would like to share with you my very own story. I'm stationed in a small town in the island of Mindanao. It was a small town with very few residences. It was a quiet and peaceful place, only a few cases of criminal activity are even reported monthly. 
On the night of November 1st, 2005, we received a rather peculiar case. It was about a sighting of some unknown entity near a local cemetery. Usually the cases that we get to are robberies, street fights, and once a month we'll get a murder. But once in a blue moon we'll get a case about something supernatural. Now before the prior sighting of the unknown entity, seven children between the ages of five and nine have now been reported missing in the past few weeks. It was a case we have no leads on or any clues except that they mysteriously disappeared near said place near the cemetery. They were part of the families that lived near the cemetery. In the Philippines, kidnappers are notorious in some places. They would take children who look healthy and would sell their organs and maybe child traffickers. The timing was also in line with All Souls Day. We Filipinos are superstitious people, so the town people were quite alarmed about the incident. The entity that was linked to the missing children, and as soon as the word got out, many believed the culprit was none other than this mysterious entity in question. Many experts in terms of the supernatural claims that the entity was eating the young souls of children, and many people swarmed the precinct, requesting a very active investigation. I was one of the dispatched police assigned to investigate said case, just to show that we listen to the people, and also, maybe we'll find a clue of this time, who's behind it, the real culprit behind the missing child. Personally, I don't believe in all that. While I do have a strong faith in God, and I'm a Christian, that's it. Anyway, it was now the next morning, November 2nd, 2005, and the two of us were sent to investigate the scene. When we got there, people are surrounded by the tree beside the cemetery. It was the same entity we had been seeing nearby. By the way, the witnesses claimed that the entity was a maligno or a malevolent spirit. These spirits live in mounds, rocks, or trees. They described this spirit having long, slender spider arms, a big, hairy body, one eye, no mouth and ears, and a long tail. They claimed to try to drag a child inside the cemetery at night, the night of November 1st. This is the spot where it happened, and people are scarce. We already tried to talk to the child, but the parents won't let us say they are adamant while keeping their children inside. This is why they surrounded it with salt, and anyone beside a family member was simply not allowed to enter. We had gone to the place where it happened after looking around. We couldn't find any clues. We stayed and surveyed the area. We went back at noon after finding nothing. Then, when 7 p.m. struck, we received yet another call that the entity showed up once again. So and me and the other officers went there and found people panicking. It was all souls day, so people were visiting the grave of a family during the incident. People were pushing each other, causing injuries. We got to the site where the entity was seen, and there were people pointing towards an old tree. They're saying that it appeared near, but then disappeared immediately. We firmly took control of the situation, made people clear out of the area. The town officials also showed up and were notified. They helped people calm down, and me and other officers split up to try and find clues. Perhaps this could just be a prank. I went towards a less populated area or place where less gravestones were. It could be where the culprit would run to. I thought I was carefully advancing, when all of a sudden I saw a shadow in my peripheral vision in my left eye immediately. I turned towards it, but there's nothing, and I felt something tugging my leg before falling forward. I was caught off guard and easily losing my balance. I hit the ground hard. I was able to use my hands to stop myself before my face hit the ground. I was about to stand when I was dragged by my left foot quite hard. I could feel my feet being clasped by something big and rough. I could feel the texture beneath the cloth, and it hurt so much at the moment. My heart was racing, and my thoughts were jumbled. I couldn't explain it, but at that moment it felt like I was in a sleep paralysis. I felt so much negative energy. I couldn't move. I knew this wasn't normal. I was aware of my surroundings, but it felt like something heavy was on my chest at the time. I knew I had simply encountered the maligno. I felt like I was dragged for a long time when suddenly I woke up and found myself lying on the ground. I was unresponsive towards whatever happened prior just staring blankly at the sky. I still remember that 
I had no thoughts at the moment. I tried to stand, but found myself unable to. My left foot was bruised and swollen again at the time. I knew it hurt. I could feel it hurting, but my mind was unresponsive. After not being able to stand, I sat on the ground like I was mindless. It didn't take long before I felt normal again. I didn't know how long I was sitting there. I don't remember after the feeling of being aware came back. I called for backup while looking around panicking and praying out loud. After a while, my colleague arrived, but I still didn't feel secure. I wanted to get out of there. Years already passed, and I still remember that one night very vividly. I was so helpless. I couldn't even look at the malignant. I thought to myself, always maybe that's what the children felt, that they were no sign of a struggle. I can't express or explain how scary the experience was. I told my story to others already, and some believe while others did not. The missing children were not found. No culprit was apprehended. Also, all the trees in and near the cemetery were cut down. No children went missing again. I was just a regular police officer in Montana, working the night shift at the station, when I stumbled upon a strange document in one of the evidence cases. It was a classified document that outlined the existence of over 20,000 cryptids in the United States alone. At first, I couldn't believe what I was reading. Cryptids, monsters, and other paranormal entities were thought to be nothing more than legends and myths. But as I dug deeper into the document, my skepticism turned to shock as I realized that one of the cryptid encounters involved my own son, who had died on a police job. I ripped the document out of the case file, not wanting anyone else to see it, and headed home. I couldn't get the image of my son out of my head, and I was desperate for answers. I tried to find a place where one of the sightings had happened, and the next day I headed out to the woods of a national park, determined to find out the truth about what had happened to my son. As I analyzed the spot, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The woods were eerily quiet, and I couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there, lurking in the shadows. I heard rustling in the leaves, and my heart began to race as I went to investigate. And then I saw it. The creature was massive, towering over me as it let out a deafening roar. It was a Sasquatch, and I was in awe of the creature standing before me. It was like nothing I had ever seen before. But as I tried to film it with my camera, I realized that it was broken. The Sasquatch quickly fled into the woods, and I was left standing there, my mind racing with thoughts and questions. I knew that I had to find out more about my son's death, and I was determined to get to the bottom of it. I spent the next few days researching the cryptids, trying to find any information I could about the creature that I had seen in the woods. But the more I learned, the more I realized that there was so much that we still didn't know about these creatures. I started to piece together what had happened to my son. He'd been on patrol in the park when he encountered the same Sasquatch that I had seen. It was a violent encounter, and my son didn't stand a chance against the massive creature. It was clear that the Sasquatch had killed him, and that the park rangers had covered it up, classifying it as an animal attack. I was filled with anger and grief, knowing that my son's death had been covered up, and that the creature that had killed him was still out there. I couldn't let this go. I had to do something. I decided to go back to the park, determined to find the Sasquatch and avenge my son's death. I set out into the woods armed with nothing but my determination and my trusty hunting rifle. I knew that this would be a dangerous task, but I was willing to risk it all to bring my son's killer to justice. As I ventured deeper into the woods, I tried to find it, but alas, he was nowhere to be found. So as I walked out of the wood, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was still so much out there that I didn't know. I couldn't help but wonder what other secrets the wilderness held and what other creatures were out there waiting to be discovered. Sorry, my son, for not avenging you. It was mid-November 2020. Juan and me and about ten friends were camping in the woods in the Sawtooth National Forest near Petite Lake.
There were two groups of four people in two tents, and one in a car, and me and my buddy were in hammocks near the edge of the camp. It's about 1 a.m., and we all had been sleeping for about two hours. I wake up to my hammock mate, panting extremely heavily and yelling my name. I am confused and get up and help him. He is paralyzed by fear. He said that he had an extremely vivid dream, that there was a black figure tall and slender, trying to break into his car after he had seen this figure decapitate me and the rest of his friends. He said that he woke up to the figure near the car and saw all of our heads stuck on sticks throughout the camp. He proceeded. He said to click the car alarm button, and the figure began to run circles around the car in the stop then dashed off extremely quickly into the woods. I was obviously freaked out at this point, and I immediately felt very uneasy. But I told him it was just a bad dream and that he needs to go back to sleep. Him and I tried for about five minutes, both stricken with fear at this point, when we hear our friend in the tent begin to yell, No, no, don't take me. Sad note, we had not awoken anyone else in the camp at this point. This freaked me and my buddy out quite a bit because we had no idea what was going on. We were also very vulnerable in our hammock by ourselves on the edge of our about 50 yard across camp. Our buddy's yells proceed to wake up most of the rest of the camp. And we find out that our friend in the car that my buddy said click the car alarm of was awake. So all of us scared and awake have a conversation about what is going on, and the buddy in the car says that he heard scratching on the window and heard something pull the door. He also said that he had seen the black figure running around the car as well. We were all freaked at this point and decided to move into the same tent. Our friend with a dream also claimed a similar murder story to the friend in the hammock. The next morning we all talked, and so many of us experienced what happened that night, six in total, that we determined that it must have been some sort of being that was giving us nightmares. We called it a windy go, but we have no idea. Also, we had friends that stayed at the same site about six months earlier, and a few of them did notice weird things happening at camp at night, like feelings of being watched or feeling of a being walking around their tent. Strange stuff in the Idaho mountains. What does this sound like, and what do y'all think? My mom lives in Sun Valley in one of the last neighborhoods at the base of the Sawtooth Mountain Range. So to give a better idea, it's past Sun Valley Ski Resort on your way to Stanley Redfish Lake area, but a bit before Smiley Creek Lodge. Anyways, the house sits next to the road with a tree line in front of it, and across the way is wooded area with a small river running through it. My husband and I would spend many nights on the front porch with his mom, as she doesn't sleep much and occasionally would sleep in the trailer out front. And every time you'd get this horribly uneasy feeling that something was watching you. There's plenty of wildlife out there, deer, elk, bears, raccoons, etc., that would come into the yard at night. But this being watched, feeling always made you scan the trees. Like something was hiding in the trees, just watching us waiting. The most notable times, it'd be the middle of summer, no wind, and you'd hear the trees rushing and see them moving as if something was moving in them, and we'd see a much darker figure moving about them. Tall Slender, if you ever heard of Slender. Man, this is where I can most relate the figure to. The nights we'd sleep in the trailer, you could hear something tapping on the doors and windows we'd blame the trees. But the trees honestly weren't close enough to tap like that. And her dog would always run to the same spot in the front yard, backyard and garage, and just start barking like there was an intruder every night. Sometime when you'd go to get the dog to stop barking, you'd hear something in the distance move off quickly. You would try to brush it off as wildlife, but it was always the same places, and it would be the darkest areas. Pretty sure the dog saw something we didn't. I've had other experiences with the dreaded feeling of being watched or followed and seeing a tall, slender shape amongst the trees, both in the Sawtooth Mountain Range. The South Hill's most creepy experience there in my own neighborhoods in town. I really believe Idaho is full of cryptic, unknown creatures simply because of the emptiness and all the strangeness that Idaho seems to harness. 
totally believe you guys ended up camping in something's home, and you were not welcome. Glad everyone is okay. I was filling in at O'Hare Fire Station, too, on the July 4th, 2022 weekend. We were outside in the patio area talking and watching the distant fireworks display. As we talked, we heard what sounded like a very loud screeching noise. It sounded like the brakes on a large truck. We didn't pay it any mind because it was probably a semi or airport maintenance vehicle that was nearby. There is a cargo terminal within sight of the station, so we didn't give it a second thought until we heard a series of clicks, rapid, loud clicking followed by that sound again. It was then that one of the other guys saw something and said, Will UTF is that? We looked up to see a figure in the sky. It looked like a human with wings, and it had a pair of bright orange eyes. One of the firefighters said it was the infamous Batman and said it was seen all over the airport and the surrounding suburb. It was only visible for about five seconds before it flew out of sight toward the north. I haven't spoken about these events to anyone since they've happened to me over a decade ago, honestly closer to 15 years. I am now a 30-year-old man, and what I experienced in Red Ash, Carryville, Tennessee, happened to me when I was about 15 or 16 years old. Red Ash is a small area off Interstate 75 running through Campbell County, Tennessee, the county where I was born and raised and still reside in now. Red Ash was established over a hundred years ago as a little mining province, but is now defined as the land between Red Ash Cemetery and Red Ash Baptist Church off of Old Tennessee Highway, 60. Three, and if you go Googling it, you'll see that it has a reputation of arguably being one of the most haunted places in Tennessee, from ghosts of miners, goat men, and even murdered witches. If you read long and deep enough, you'll see there's lots of strange happenings around this area. But I am not here to tell you I saw a seven-foot-tall man with the head of a goat and hooven feet standing at the base of a train track tussle. But what I saw I still to this day can't explain. About 15 years ago, a few friends and I, one guy who was a couple years older than myself and two lady friends of ours, were driving around one Saturday night looking to find something to get into in our small, quiet town. So naturally, of course, we came to the conclusion to do what all the teenage kids do that grow up in our county. We decided to go to Red Ash and test some of the legends, and boy, are there a lot of them. But those are stories for a different page. This one isn't about urban legends. This is about what I actually saw. We went to a set of train tracks that if you park on and turn your vehicle off that, somehow the car will start to rock and gently roll off the tracks. That didn't work for us, so we decided to head up the road to the cemetery to tell ghost stories. On the ride to the cemetery, one of the girls with us said her grandpa had told her on one of the unnamed dirt roads in Red Ash is an old abandoned graveyard where a lady was murdered and buried almost 200 years ago for supposedly being a witch. We thought what the hell and decided to go looking for this graveyard to see if we could find the unmarked grave. We turned down one dirt road barely wide enough for my friend's small car and drove down it for a few minutes when all of a sudden we're hit with blue lights behind us. And when I say all of a sudden, I mean it. Now, mind you, it was around midnight and pretty dark out, but we didn't see headlights or anything trailing behind us, just the burst of blue police lights. My friend pulls off the road as much as possible, and the cop pulls behind us and gets out of his cruiser and walks to the door. My friend already has his window down. It's late July and 80 degrees at night with no A.C. in his car, and he is waiting to be asked for his license and registration. The cop doesn't ask for. He walks up and looks through the rolled-down window at my friend and says, You guys shouldn't be here. It's dangerous and a bad place. Please leave. Now, I'm not sure about you guys, but hearing a cop say shouldn't and please isn't normal. Usually we hear can't and now, but that's what he said. 
and it threw my friend off, and he kind of stammered for words before the cop repeated himself. Please tell me you'll turn around. You shouldn't be here. It's dangerous. This time, though, my friend said yes, sir, and the cop just turned around and walked back to his car, turned off his lights and drove around us, continuing on the road. That's when I noticed he wasn't driving one of the Tahoes or Chargers they typically drove, but a Crown Vix in an old Crown Vic, an early 80-square-body Crown Victoria car. It was so bizarre, but we didn't think much of it then. We just decided to head straight and follow him and turn around when he did. We followed him for a few seconds up until he went up the hill on the dirt road and went around the curve. Once we got up there past the curve and we noticed he was gone. Couldn't see any signs of his vehicle or anything. He wasn't pulled over off the road, so we thought he might have been more familiar with the road and must have sped up to get to the end of it. So we followed the road for a couple more miles, no sign of the cop anywhere until we got to the end of the road, and it ended in a dead end. The cop was still nowhere to be found. No signs of him passing us pulling off the road, which was barely wide enough for him to pass us while we were pulled off it earlier, and there were no roads connecting to this old dirt road. So many little weird things happened, and honestly, I still don't know what I saw or how to explain it. All I can say is that things are weird up there around red ash, and even now, I still listen to that cop. It's dangerous up there, and I stay away from it. A few years ago in my previous home, I saw a strange aberration in the hallway by my son's room. It looked like a hazy, distorted image of a humanoid figure. I did not think much of it and thought it was just my mind thinking something was there that really wasn't. I occurred a few times, but then one day I heard my son screaming and crying. I could tell from his cry that it was something serious and not him just being upset about something. I ran into his room and he was crying, saying that there was a big, scary man in his room and scaring him. It was one of the weirdest and scariest moments of my life. I knew there was no one else in the house, but could tell my son was truly terrified from whatever had just happened to him. My wife was with me when this happened, and afterwards she told me she had seen the same thing. I had seen but also thought nothing of it. We had a spare bedroom by the kids' room where the grandparents stayed when they were in town. They also spoke of hearing footsteps at night and voices. I personally never experienced those, but that just made the whole situation even stranger. This was back in 6-7, not sure. I was between 17 and 18 year old. Me and three friends stayed the night out in the desert of Adelanto, California. One of them lived in a trailer in the middle of nowhere, which was fine because we were partying. Something happens during the kickback, and I I get mad and storm off outside. I walk for a good five minutes when all of a sudden the hairs in the back of my neck stand up. I'm confused by this unintentional reaction to God only knows what. I stop walking. All wildlife stops with me. No more crickets. No owls. Dead silent. I look straight ahead to my left, and I see a figure about six or more. Move between two large cacti's, and I immediately book it. I run as fast as I can, knowing something is chasing me. I run inside the trailer and slam the door, while screaming bloody murder, and frantically am trying to tell my friends what just happened. They all started laughing, thinking I was nuts. But then out of nowhere, you could hear a scrape running alongside the trailer, like claws on metal. Everyone freezes, and we spend the rest of the night guarding all doors and windows. After that night, it was never spoken of again. Has anyone experienced anything like this? Little background, I'm agnostic and pretty skeptical. I don't believe in really anything paranormal, but I was raised as a Jehovah's Witness, and the time of this story was during the late 80s early 90s mid-satanic panic era. There was a lot of circulated rumors about this or that being demonics, and you had to be careful about what you're brought into your house lest you invite demons into your home. 
so I guess they're like vampires or bed bugs. Also, lots of urban legend stories, a lot of them involving Smurfs, like Smurf wallpaper, stomping newborns to death in their sleep and the like. Important to understand is that Jews don't believe in ghosts or aliens or anything else, but rather than discount the stories themselves altogether, they merely blame them on bored, vindictive demons messing with us because they've been banished to earth. As they are fallen angels, oh, an interesting side note. Apparently, this eviction from heaven only happened in 1914. Not sure why God waited so long. Maybe it's like renter's protection, and he needed to give them tons of notice in a free month's rent or something. But I digress. So, yeah, basically, if there was a J.W. Scooby-Doo cartoon, every ending would be the same. Now let's see who's really behind this and they'd remove the rubber alien mask, the glowing ghost sheet, the dinosaur fossil. I knew it, just a regular old demon. Anyway, around nine, ten years old, I start being left home alone. Big family, so didn't happen much, but when it did, I started noticing things from the corner of my eye around the edges of darkened corners. Only a couple of times did I notice a discernible shape and it looked like this stuffed toy someone in the house had recently gotten. Black-furred, big-nosed, kinda goofy, yet terrifying in the right context. I guess think five nights at Freddy's style. Sometimes I'd get so freaked out I'd bolt out of the house with barely a jacket or shoes on and sit outside my house in the winter. I can't remember what excuse I gave when my family came home and found me shivering on the stoop, but I didn't tell them the truth. I even started to join my mom on painfully boring errands. Kids nowadays will likely fail to understand what hours of errands at the hair salon, dry cleaners, the bank or Fanny's Fabrics is like without cell phones, or Nintendo Switches. At best, we had Tiger handheld games, which were typically less fun than simply staring at your hands. But I endured it all rather than be left alone with the demons. In retrospect, all of this is easily dismissed. Young mind crammed full of the idea that the world is teeming with demons out to get him, is left alone for the first time in his life, and his mind conjures demons out of flickering shadows. But it's what comes next. I can never hand wave away quite so easily. I'm about eleven-ish, I think, and I lose one of my last baby teeth. Maybe my last one I don't remember. But it's a molar. J.W.'s famously don't celebrate anything, but there is few things that weren't forbidden. I just don't remember if we did the tooth fairy thing. I mean, I know there was no pretense of a fairy, just my mom taking my tooth and giving me a dollar. But I know I didn't get a dollar for this last one. Maybe it was too late in the game, being the last dish tooth and being the youngest of eight kids. The kid tooth market was now incredibly saturated. She probably had a coffee can full. Technically, she might have even qualified as an ivory dealer. So I go to bed that night, and I have an oddly specific memory of putting my tooth on my bedside table on the metal base of my lamp. I wake up sometime during the night, and it's full, deep, silent, scary night. Not my parents are still awake, and I can hear them watching MASH in the living room night. It's one of those half-awakes where your dreams are still a vivid reality and you can effortlessly step back in them. I'm instantly aware of a large, bluish-white, glowing presence at the end of my bed. It's an angel with it's back to me, focused on something else, which is odd in and of itself is the only thing in that part of my room of interest was my Dick Tracy action figures. So hopefully he was bringing me the blank figure, because I couldn't find that shit anywhere. I don't remember if I could move, but I didn't. I was scared, but in an oddly detached, non-panicky sort of way. He became aware of me and looked back, and not in a malevolent way, but not kindly either. It was more of a cold, slightly sneering indifference. Then I just fell back asleep which was obviously odd had it been someone innocuous like my mom in my room at 3 a.m. I doubt I'd have drifted back off so quickly, let alone a potentially fallen angel rooting through my collectibles. 
I loved those Dick Tracy toys, and I was very paranoid and protective about losing the Tommy guns on those things. It happened to Jubja Powell of mine. His mom took them all their weapons, and he was left with a bunch of squat Lego grip-handed, suited old men with stupid hats. And who wants to play with that? But I digress again. Then I just awoke in the morning, but I didn't immediately remember the previous night's visitor. I woke, just like any other morning, sat up, but then paused during my crooked uh, stretching as my rested on my molar, still on the lamp base, but it had been expertly cut in half. It was perfectly smooth, like it'd been done with a laser, and the other half was gone. I didn't immediately suspect my mother. Firstly, I doubted she had access to that level of technology, and second, if it was her, then where was my fifty cents? Only then did I recall the previous night's events, and as you can imagine, it shook me up. I mean, there was the spooky, paranormal aspects that would scare anyone, but atop all it was the sheer randomness of it. Nothing added up to anything. It was just an absolute casserole of nonsense. Now had the demon slash angel burnt a cockeyed 666 on my wall and left a steaming cauldron stuffed with Smurf merchandise. Then okay, sure, I'd have been terrified. But at least it would have been on brand and fallen neatly into place with everything else I knew. But what the F did he want with half my tooth? I snatched up my half-tooth and went to find my mother, not really expecting answers, but at least wanting someone else to acknowledge and share in this messed-up situation. When I found her, I didn't editorialize or bring up any of the angel business, just handed it over with a hey look what happened to my tooth when I was asleep. She examined it closely, but far too briefly, and handed it back with something like, ha, huh, that's kind of weird, hey. Where's your father? Tell him breakfast is ready. Her lack of astonishment felt suspect. I went looking for my dad with the inner monologue of a TV detective. No, I don't think she did it, but she knows more than she's telling us. I didn't even bring it up to my dad as my relationship with him was fraught, and it felt unwise to do so. More than likely, I'd have been blamed for it in some way, and I'd be interrogated about my cola consumption. So I sat on this info. I think I tried to bring it up casually with my mom again later, but again got nothing. A week or so later, it was missing off my dresser. I thought I maybe knocked it off or something and it'd show up eventually, but it never did. Shortly after this incident, we moved to a new house and I never saw the flickering shadow demons again. I never had any more issues with being left alone in the house. As a skeptical adult looking back, I can say, Look, I turned twelve. I got over my fear of being home alone, and maybe I conjured the angel memory from nothing after that tooth incident. But that doesn't explain the tooth. I remember the tooth. I could feel myself grasping for plausible scenarios. Maybe there's some medical test that requires an inner tooth test, so my parents took it. But then why not just tell me? Why return the other half? It's the whole issue with this incident as even if you accept the existence of angels, demons, ghosts, or the chupacabra, it doesn't really explain anything meaningful. So yeah, that's it. I don't think about it often. But when I do, it still bothers me. So at the end of all of this, I just hope someone or something is waiting for me, and they have with them half my tooth and some answers. It was a dark and stormy night when park ranger John received a call from a distressed camper, Sarah. She had been camping deep in the woods of a remote national park and had come across a strange creature she could only describe as a Sasquatch. John, skeptical but concerned, set out to investigate. As he made his way through the dense forest, the wind howled and the rain pounded against his hood. He couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. But as he approached Sarah's campsite, he found no sign of the creature. Sarah, however, was in a state of panic. She insisted that the Sasquatch had been stalking her all night, and that it had tried to attack her. John tried to calm Sarah down, but she was too afraid to stay in the woods. He decided to escort her out of the park. 
As they walked, John couldn't shake the feeling that they were being followed. Suddenly, Sarah stopped in her tracks. She pointed to a dark figure emerging from the shadows. It was a Sasquatch. John, being a park ranger, knew that these creatures are not supposed to exist and thought it might be some kind of elaborate hoax. But as the creature stepped into the light, John could see that it was real and it was huge. The Sasquatch let out a deafening roar and charged at them. John quickly grabbed Sarah and they ran for their lives. They reached the ranger station and reported the incident to the government officials in charge of the park, but they were met with skepticism and disbelief. The government officials thought it was a hoax, a publicity stunt to attract more visitors to the park. But as the days passed, more and more reports of Sasquatch sightings came in. The park was closed and a team of scientists was sent in to investigate. They discovered that the Sasquatch was not a wild animal, but a genetically engineered creature created by a mad scientist who had been experimenting with DNA manipulation in the deep woods. John tried to warn the government officials of the danger this creature posed, but they refused to listen. They were more interested in covering up the truth and protecting their own interests. As the days passed, the Sasquatch grew more aggressive and began attacking campers and hikers. Despite John's warnings, the government officials refused to take action. It was only when the creature killed several people that they finally agreed to take action. But it was too late. The Sasquatch had grown too powerful and was impossible to capture or kill. It roamed the park, terrorizing the visitors and locals alike. John, feeling guilty for not being able to stop the creature, decided to take matters into his own hands. He set out into the deep woods, determined to put an end to the terror once and for all. But the Sasquatch was too much for him to handle. In a tragic and gruesome end, the creature killed John, and his body was found by Sarah, who was camping again. The government officials, guilty of their actions, closed the park forever and tried to cover up the truth. But the legend of the creature and ranger John, who tried to save people from it, lived on. And it became a horror story that passed through generations. The tragic end of this story still haunts the deep woods of the National Park. And it's said that on stormy nights, the screams of John and Sarah can still be heard. I was a young police officer just starting out in my career. I was eager to make a difference and prove myself to my colleagues and superiors. One day, while I was on duty at the police station, I came across a strange note on my desk. It was folded up and had my name written on the front in sloppy handwriting. I opened it up and found a mysterious address written inside. It was in a part of town that I wasn't familiar with, but something about the note made me feel like I needed to go check it out. I had a strange sense of unease wash over me as I read the note, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to follow through with this. I grabbed my keys and headed out to my patrol car. As I was driving, the unease only grew stronger. I tried to shake it off and focus on the task at hand, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. When I finally arrived at the address, I saw that it was an abandoned house. It was a creepy old place that looked like it hadn't been inhabited in years. I hesitated for a moment, but then I got out of my car and approached the house. I knocked on the door, but no one answered. I knew that I shouldn't go inside, but something was pulling me towards the house. I couldn't explain it, but I felt like I needed to see what was inside. So, I made the decision to break in. As I stepped inside, I was immediately hit with a feeling of dread. The place was dark and musty, and it seemed to have an energy that was all its own. I shone my flashlight around, but I couldn't see much. The room was empty, and there was a thick layer of dust on everything. I made my way through the house, searching for any clues or signs of what might have happened here. As I was exploring, I suddenly heard a noise behind me. I turned around, but there was nothing there. I continued on, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I heard more noises and saw shadows moving in the corners of my eyes, but whenever I turned to look, there was nothing there. I was starting to feel like I was being played with, like something was toying with me. 
I knew I needed to get out of there, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being drawn deeper into the house. As I turned a corner, I came face to face with a creature that I had never seen before. It was like a vampire, but different. It had long, sharp teeth and pale, clammy skin. Its eyes glowed red in the darkness. I froze, unable to move, as the creature hissed and lunged at me. It was fast, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to outrun it. I tried to fight back, but it was too strong. It knocked me to the ground and fled, leaving me lying there in the dust. I don't know how long I lay there, but eventually I was able to pull myself together and make my way out of the house. I stumbled back to my car and drove back to the police station, trying to make sense of what had just happened. I never went back to that abandoned house, and I never spoke to anyone about what I had seen. It was like a nightmare that I couldn't shake, and I couldn't bring myself to talk about it. But I knew that I would never forget that strange, terrifying creature. We went camping last month, and in the middle of the night, some panicked guy started banging super hard on someone's camper, screaming maniacally, Danny, let me in. Danny, please hurry. Danny, I'm scared. Let me in. Open the door. Why are you doing this to me? Please, I'm scared. Hurry, please. Why are you doing this to me? It was a grown man, and it was like 3 a.m., and this went on for almost two hours. We tried calling all the after-hours park numbers for help, and no one answered. He sounded like he was either on drugs and having a bad trip, or like there was something else wrong with him. He was so distressed that it was genuinely disturbing, but we had our two small kids with us, who slept through it all, thankfully, and didn't feel safe approaching to see if we could help, because this man did not sound like he was in his right mind. And also, there was no way the person inside didn't hear him. So maybe they had a good reason not to let him in. Maybe they locked him out to keep themselves safe. We didn't know, but he sounded terrified, too. He eventually stopped, but then their car alarm started going off, sometimes for half-hour long stretches for the rest of the morning. We got no sleep that night. It was definitely the strangest night camping that we've ever endured. The next day, no one had any information about what happened. During a winter camping trip in Algonquin Park, we heard two distinct and unusual noises. We heard the first noise in the evening while skiing into the park, trying to find a place to set up camp in the dark. The noise is somewhat hard to describe and sounded completely unnatural. It sounded like an electronically produced reverberation of some kind. At the time, we guessed it was some kind of weird animal call. We speculated perhaps a moose or water-moving pockets of air trapped under frozen lake ice or aliens. We later discovered that this noise was actually produced by a natural phenomenon called acoustic dispersion. Google it and listen to videos. The second noise occurred on that same night after we had bed down in tent for the night. This noise was clearly an animal or several animals, and it sounded much like laughing, yelping, or high-pitched barking. The unnerving thing about the noise was how it appeared to move through the forest, closer to the tent, right next to the tent, and eventually past the tent, and then finally far away from the tent. Whatever was producing those noises had moved through our campsite at a fairly rapid pace, but without making any discernible rustling, crunching of snow or footfalls, only the haunting vocalizations of whatever the animal was. I later heard similar noises outside of my condo window back home in a more urban setting, asked neighbors about it, and was told that the noises are made by coyotes that hunt in the wooded areas along the hydro and rail corridor. My father and I had just left the La Burbuja grocery store and were crossing 32nd to go toward my car when we heard what sounded like a baby crying out. We thought it was maybe one of the neighbor's babies, but then my father said Mariah Maja and was pointing toward the house across the street. I looked and saw a thin black figure perched on the brick fence post and looking directly at us. This thing was dark, dark black. It actually looked like it was absorbing the light around it. 
It was very easy to make out the body, the wings, and the long pointed tail that it swished around, much like a cat does when it is interested in something. The eyes were the most striking feature as they were glowing bright red and were locked directly on my father and me. I was frozen in fear, and the only thing going through my mind was how to defend my elderly father if this thing decided to attack us. I could care less about myself, but my father is seventy years old and not able to move or defend himself if he was attacked. I could hear my father praying and asking La Virgin de Guadalupe for protection and to send this thing away. I managed to tell my father that we needed to get into the car as quickly as possible so he could be safe. I pressed the button to the remote, and the horn chirped as the alarm was deactivated, and the doors unlocked. At the sound of the horn chirping, this thing opened its wings and stood up on the fence post and chirped back at us. It took off and hovered for a few seconds, its wings flapping and making a light whoosh sound. My father and I dove into the relative safety of the car as this thing flew away and was gone from our sight. This thing was maybe three, four feet tall and thin, but its wings were large and maybe ten feet when spread apart. They looked a lot like bat wings. No feathers were visible as it was jet black. We drove straight home and my father told my mother and my sister about our encounter with this thing and what had happened. My mother said it was probably a brugia disguised as a lechuza and that we were lucky we were not attacked either way. She refused to let anyone out of the house for the rest of the night. My friend and I used to go cycling in the woods every weekend in summer when we were younger around the ages of 10, 13. The woodland near where I live, suburbs of London, is ancient and has a lot of history, especially with old ruinous manors from the medieval times dotted around. We have so many happy memories from that period, but one really peculiar and scary evening stands out. One evening we went deep into the woods and checked out this old abandoned farm where there were these huge pine trees in the center of the field. We had to hop a couple fences to reach these trees, and there was always something majestic about these isolated trees in a field. Anyways, when we left the field, it must have been around six, seven o'clock, as it was still crystal blue sky. In England, it doesn't get dark until about nine, ten in summer. I remember we both had this unbelievable sense of dread and panic that come over us, so we cycled off as fast as we could towards the exit, which was a tunnel into the back road. This was only a five-minute cycle from the field with the isolated pine trees. However, my friend disappeared, and it felt like within a matter of minutes it was pitch black. I remember waiting at the entrance of the tunnel for my friend as I was too scared to go through it alone, and it felt like I was waiting for hours. He turned up eventually, and he had no explanation as to where he had gone. Essentially, it felt as though two, three hours had been compressed into five minutes and daylight turned to dusk with a flick of a switch. To this day, I have no explanation as to what the sensation we felt was and how time seemed to warp. Those woods have always had an eerie and mystical feel about them. That sound brought one of my brothers into the house to alert the rest of the family to come hear this. We went outside and stood in the driveway and heard the most frightening guttural roar you can imagine. This accompanied the pounding on the wood object. This lasted several minutes. The evening was clear, warm, and without wind. I do not remember a moon. Neither brother could explain what was happening, and I recall being scared out of my wits. When the sound subsided, the family returned inside. The incident was not discussed in front of me again. As a child, I was privileged to live in this remote, beautiful area and be allowed to run free. Sometime later, a boyfriend and I observed what we were told must have been a bear in a thicket of alder trees near the house. The feces found there later contained crawdad shells and berry seeds with a horrible odor. But the creature we saw was not a bear. The hard, dry ground showed no tracks. Our fathers were loggers, and we were well versed in the local wildlife. While this all happened a very long time ago, I still get cold chills remembering those sounds. 
Years later, my fiancé and I were driving north on Oregon Highway 101 near Cape Perpetua, north of Florence, Oregon. The highway was narrow, two lane with the Pacific Ocean on the west and steep rock cliffs on the east. I was watching the moon over the ocean, turned sideways facing the ocean. A very large black creature rose from a cliff in the cliff and towered over the little car we were in. My fiancé yelled, what the hell was that? I only caught a glimpse of the thing through my peripheral vision, but it was huge and very fast. I suppose we surprised it as much as it surprised us. It terrified me. My fiancé searched for a place to turn around as he wanted to go back, and I refused to let him. We were armed with what suddenly seemed to be a very small weapon, considering the size of the creature. When we returned home, my fiancé told his father about the encounter. His father told us of the rancher at the foot of the capes, also on Highway 101, who had been riding to check on his cattle when he heard a cow bellowing in agony. His horse became nervous, but he forced it on and found a very large, hairy animal chewing on the live cow. He carried a thirty-point-six rifle and shot the creature. It stood up and ran off on two legs. He followed until he lost the trail of blood in the rocky terrain. This is the first time I have ever heard of someone shooting and wounding one of these creatures. It is also the first time I've heard of this creature eating the meat of any animal. Our encounter was in the late evening with clear skies and a full moon. My fiancé saw the creature in the headlights and had a great view of it. He knew it was not a bear and didn't think it was a human in a pursuit. Facial features did not have a snout, and the arms were too long for a bear's front legs. I was too terrified to grasp any features. I have never felt fear like that before or, or since. I went camping on Lake Michigan's shore one time. I was solo and it was rustic. I was on a small ridge close to the beach but couldn't actually see the shore. My small fire was dying, and I was about to turn in when I started hearing this strange wet quack sound on the beat. Happened two or three times in succession. Sounded like a watermelon being hit with a baseball bat. Then all of a sudden a light appeared over the ridge. Looked like it was scanning the tree line. After a second, the light goes back down, and I hear a couple more whacks. Silence, then a few more whacks. Twenty, thirty feet down the beat. Then the light is back. Then three more lights pop up and start moving up and down the beach. Then they left. There were definitely points in time where I was sitting there, knife in hand, waiting for this band of rogues to come murder me. I researched when I got home, and I think they were just digging for clams or mussels or something. But for 15, 20 minutes, it was real, real creepy. Crown Land, camping in Ontario in early January. It was an isolated spot beside a fairly large lake, which was completely frozen over. Temperature hovered around 8 Celsius the whole trip, but went above freezing for a day. After the sun set, the frozen lake began making an eerie noise every few minutes, like a low-flying jet, followed by a massive, slow bloop coming from the depths of the lake. Occasionally, a crack would shoot across the sheet of ice covering the lake shore to shore about half a kilometer, in less than a second. Buddies were freaking out at first, speculating we had awoken a lake monster or something. Probably smoked too many joints that night. Obviously, these were the natural sounds of the lake as it melted, possibly something to do with the fluid dynamics as it changed state from solid ice to liquid water. Just a theory, but nevertheless, we were in awe of the forces of nature at work. All the more terrifying, considering the day before we had been screwing around on the frozen lake, unaware that the entire ice sheet was melting away underneath us. Falling through the ice would put an end to the fun quickly. I decided to rent a cabin way up in northern Michigan for a week with my sister Tanya. My sister is a writer and... This was also what she needed because she hadn't written in two weeks. So off we went. It was late May and still quite chilly, but we didn't care about the weather because we weren't there for sunbathing on the beach. The cottage was rustic but recently redone, and it was located on a small pond, 
but was surrounded by thick woods. Our cottage was the last one down a long dirt road. The cottage owner had put in several really nice long trails, because if not then, nobody was enjoying the woods. The first day we were unloading our luggage from the car, and a young guy and his mom walked up the driveway. They introduced themselves and said they owned the house a little way down the road, and they went for walks a few times a week for exercise past the cottage. The mother Linda mentioned that her husband had passed away a few years earlier, and of course I told her that I lost my husband Josh a few months earlier as well. Linda looked so sad for me, but her son Brendan had a smirk on his face which really creeped me out. Linda seemed to notice this as well and said, Okay, let's leave these ladies to unpack, and then said their goodbyes. I was unnerved by the way Brendan looked at me, and I noticed he kept looking back at me as they walked away. On the first day, we just hung around the cabin. The next day, I went for a walk alone so Tanya could get some writing done. I chose the path the owner said was the easiest. I had been walking for ten minutes when I heard the sound of a small animal moving through the underbrush, maybe something the size of a rabbit, so I stopped to listen, and when I stopped, the rustling stopped. I happened to glance back, and I saw the shape of a human standing behind the thicket. I thought it was Brandon, so I turned and kept walking. I was almost halfway, and I'd see a tree about thirty feet in front of me, but completely surrounded by the same thicket. I saw what again I perceived to be a naked Brandon. I couldn't see clearly because he was shrouded in darkness, but I saw him perched on the bottom limb of a tree, just crouched there, staring at me. I could see one hand holding the limb he was crouched on, and his other arm was wrapped around the tree trunk. But now that I look back and I know what I was looking at, I can't believe I thought it was Brandon. A day or two later, I was finally able to pull Tanya away from her laptop, and we were on the porch to watch the sunset. We distinctly heard a wolf howl from at least the other side of the pond. We agreed it was really close, but we weren't too worried. We were more worried about the mother bears, as we were told by Linda and the cabin owner that we needed to keep the bear spray on us at all times because the cubs were very young, and the mothers were really protective. About ten minutes later, we heard an animal screaming. Oh, my gosh, we were both saying and covering our ears. Tanya was saying this is too close to nature for me. Then Tanya went in to use the bathroom, and when she came back, she said, What is that? and pointed to the wood line. I saw the shrubs shaking. Then an animal came out of the woods with a baby deer hanging from its mouth. The baby wasn't just a newborn. We looked at pictures showing various ages, and it was probably two weeks old, approximately. We are not country girls, so please don't get on me for being wrong. Anyway, Tanya said, no, I don't want to see this, and she went inside. I sat looking at this animal. I was fairly certain the fawn was already dead, or I would have done something, at least I'd like to think I would have. What? I don't know. But regardless, I was trying to figure out what this animal was. It was walking into the open from the woods. It dropped the fawn from its mouth. Then it started sniffing it. I was fairly certain that this was a very large wolf with a case of the mange because its hair was thick around the neck like a lion's mane, and it was thin to bear in spots. Its rear end was bald, and I didn't even see a tail. I noticed it looked almost deformed because the back end sat way lower than the front. The animal seemed almost mesmerized by the fawn. It stared and sniffed at it. Then it pushed it forward or over by using its nose. Then it picked it up by the mouth and started shaking it side to side viciously. Then it started biting into the midsection. And when it lifted its head to chew, you could clearly see intestines hanging out of its mouth. Now I believe I let out a sound at that point because it looked at me surprised and then ran about ten feet to the large tree. It turned around and literally stood on its back legs. Oh, my gosh! I realized this was the thing I saw up in the tree. I could clearly see the eyes were rusty-colored and they were illuminated. They were glowing from the inside. It was starting to turn dusk. It just continued to stand there behind that tree. It seemed to be apprehensive a little, but it was staring at me, and then it would look towards the phone. At one point, I thought I saw it lift its lip, and the whole muzzle started to vibrate like it was trying not to bare its teeth. 
Finally, it got down on all four feet and started walking slowly to the fawn. When it was almost there, it swung its head in my direction and let out a low, menacing growl. At the same time, it bared its teeth. This animal was at least 400 pounds. It could be even bigger, but I'm afraid that the naysayers will call me a liar. This animal was at least three to four times as big as my German Shepherd. All the way around its head was huge. But what really terrified me was when it sneered at me and went down for the fawn. Its teeth were at least three inches long, sharp and jagged. When it got to the fawn, it picked it up in its mouth and took off at a fast slope. We didn't leave for walks after that. We barely left the cabin. When we did leave the last day, we drove over to that tree, and I got out and stood beside where it stood. And I can say without a doubt it was well over six and a half to seven and a half feet tall. We drove past Linda's house, and on second thought, I asked Tanya to turn back around. I wanted to tell them what we saw. Linda was genuinely concerned and seemed shocked to hear what we saw. She appreciated that we thought enough to stop. When we got home, we called the landlord, and he said straight away that we were warned to carry bear spray, so I just left it at that. I figured he thought we wanted our money back, and that wasn't the case. So that's our story. I'm pretty sure it wasn't a Bigfoot. Taking a day hike with a friend on the Appalachian Trail in New Jersey many years ago. It was a nice day, and we were hiking and making idle chat. All of a sudden, from the low brush along the side of the trail, right next to our feet, came this ear-piercing, high-pitched and long screaming sound. I can only describe it like a woman screaming after in helium. We froze in our tracks, and it screamed for about five seconds. Although it felt like longer, whatever it was started running off through the brush and bushes. Neither of us even caught a glimpse of it. It felt like a sci-fi or horror, moving where we could see the grass and branches rustling while it ran off. But neither of us saw a single part of it or even get an idea of the shape and size. But the brush was only thigh high, so it couldn't have been too big. After being frozen in place from surprise and fear for about 30 seconds, we decided to keep walking and talk about it after we gained some distance. But we had very little to discuss other than a repeated, What the hell was that? Growing up with stories about the New Jersey Devil didn't help our imaginations. But you never know. This incident occurred in Memphis, Tennessee. I started my career as a Memphis police officer a few years previously in the 1980s. I was on a special assignment at the time. It was 2 a.m., and it was a clear summer night, but quite humid. I was in my personal vehicle with the top down and the radio playing. I was still in my uniform, including my bulletproof vest and a gun belt with all the regular equipment attached to it. I was heading south on Covington Pike at a good rate of speed and was the only one on the road. This part of the road connects the Raleigh Bartlett area to the Burr area. The road is slightly elevated as the surrounding area is low and running through it is the Wolf River, which is a few miles from here and connects to the Mississippi River. This area is commonly referred to by the locals as the Wolf River Bottoms these days. As I was driving in my peripheral vision, over to my right, just outside my headlight beams, I noticed something was moving fast, directly toward the front of my car. I immediately slammed on the brakes, thinking that a deer was running across the road. But I couldn't have been more wrong. It came to a screeching halt right in the middle of the road, right in front of my headlights, not more than seven feet from my bumper, as we both froze in place, staring at each other for several seconds. It appeared to be three to four feet tall, but was also crouched. It could have been closer to five if it stood straight up, but I got the impression that its current body posture was its normal way of standing. It had a large head, at least compared to its skinny, slender body. It appeared to be dark gray and greenish in color, similar to the color of an alligator, but the appearance of its skin looked like a similar texture to a human's. 
It had dark, large oval eyes on each side of the upper part of its face, running slanted from the top portion of its head to about the midsection of its head. It was kind of pointing inward to where you would expect a nose to be. However, from what I could tell, there was no distinct nose, at least none like a human. Below the eyes was a very thin, dark, almost black line, which I assumed was its mouth. It ran from about the same location a human's mouth would be. However, the line ran straight across the lower face in front, and then turned upward and slightly back on the head. It had no ears that could see. Its body and chest area were rounded like a human, but vastly smaller, almost like a child's. Its arms appeared to be longer and somewhat disproportionate to its body, and they were skinny and had an insect-type look to them. I could make out hands, but they were also completely folded at the wrist joint. The legs were long because, even with this thing's shortness, I could make out the top of them, even with it so close to the bumper, which was obscuring the bottom half somewhat. They were like the arms, thin and insect-like, but appeared to be jointed. I did notice its chest area moving slightly like it was breathing, but it seemed slow and steady. I never noticed anything like genitalia. There was no hair any place that I could see in. I'm not even sure if it was wearing any type of clothing. If it was, it would have had to be skin tight. I never noticed a tail at any point. My adrenaline was pumping, and it was only a brief period of observation. It again took off like a shot, and it was out of my headlights. I could still make out its outline in the darkness, and it was moving like a sprinter. It leaped over the guardrail onto the other side of the road and down the embankment. I will admit that this was not the only bizarre incident that I had during my career, but it definitely was the strangest. I never told anyone on the force about the encounter. In fact, I only mentioned it to a close friend during these many years. I can only identify it as a lizard man or an unknown humanoid. I would have never believed it unless I actually witnessed it. When I was 11 or 12, I was at a Boy Scout camp in the Midwestern USA talking with some friends in the tent at night. For some reason, I poked my head out through the flap to look outside, and I saw a scene that was totally bizarre. I was deep in a forest, but I saw red lights moving all around as though there were some kind of carnival in front of me. Some of the lights were moving in circles or back and forth. One thing looked like an arrow with stripes that was motionless at first, and then launched and bounced back and forth slightly, as though it were attached to a stiff spring. I was mesmerized by it, but I had no idea what on earth I was looking at. I didn't see any people or anything unusual other than the red lights, and I didn't hear anything out of the ordinary. Otherwise, it was just darkness and trees. I pulled my head back into the tent and told my friends I saw something weird. One of them poked his head out and said he saw it too, but he couldn't describe it, and I think he just thought I was playing a joke and wanted to join in. I looked out again myself, and I saw someone's flashlight moving in the distance as they walked, but that wasn't anything out of the ordinary. To this day, I have no idea what that was about. My depth perception of the lights felt strange, as though I was seeing two images at the same time, the actual dark forest in front of me, with a moving image of the light superimposed over it. I was skeptical of aliens and UFOs, but it definitely had me thinking about them. I told everyone about it the next day in detail, and nobody else had seen anything similar. It was just a weird thing that nobody could explain. This happened in fall of 2020, one in Hammiston Turi Wilderness area in Finland. I had already been in the bush for 15 weeks and still had about a week left. No people in sight except a friend who I parted ways with after a couple of days and a reindeer herder so far away. I don't think he even spotted me. I was making my way towards this old dilapidated wilderness hut, which was not in use anymore, and suddenly I hear talking. I stop and try to listen. Where is the sound coming from? It sounds like multiple guys. After a while, I can pinpoint the direction and start walking there to say hi. 
I stumble in the middle of four guys in their mid-twenties, high as balls, eyes red, cockmouth, and one dude is playing some shitty reggie from a Bluetooth speaker. Now at this point, the nearest road is approximately 30 kilometers away. We start chatting, and I spot that these guys' gear is a bit makeshift-esque. Not judging, but these guys don't give out the vibe of a hardened hiker who makes their own gear. After a bit of chatting, I learned that. These guys don't have a map. They don't have a compass. They have a shit ton of weed. They have consumed a lot of it. Now I try my best to give these guys some directions, but they are high F. Looking at my map, I spot a stream which goes towards the road. Their car is at. So I guide them to follow this stream, and when they arrive to the road, turn right, and after one kilometer, they will arrive to their car. I had to handwrite these instructions four times on a piece of toilet paper in hopes that one always has those instructions. We parted ways. They gladly offered some weed, which I declined, did get a small bottle of whiskey, though. After my hike, I had to Google missing hikers in Hemostuntry, but didn't find anything, so I think they got it out all. This happened in 2016, so I was around 20, 122. Friend was driving me home from her house. The road we normally took, back road but very busy with traffic, was closed for construction, so we took the detour road. We had the windows down because we had finished a blunt about 15 minutes prior. This was a 30 minutes ride back to my house. Halfway through the detour road, we both get this sense of absolute evil dread, and we then both notice that there is no sound. No nature sounds, frogs croaking, breeze through the trees, wind from the car. The radio was on and not playing music, no matter how we fwiv the channel or the volume. It was like we were in an air pocket with absolutely no sound whatsoever. You could barely see outside, but we at least could make out trees and shit with the headlights. Nope. Looked like we were in a completely dark tunnel. Lasted about five minutes, and then all of a sudden, the noise came back on with this sudden pop. Frogs, trees, the sound of the car, the radio, all of it. We kind of just sat still and said nothing, and as soon as we saw a gas station, she pulled over and we smoked a cigarette, and we were both kind of like, ha, ah, what just happened? Ha 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 ha. Everything was 100% normal after that, and it never happened again. I've been on that road hundreds of times since, but it was genuinely strange, and it scared the shit out of both of us. I'm located in the 559. There are a lot of Mary Jane growers out here. There was an illegal farm out in the country country of Clovis. It was ran by Asians. To conceal the grow-off, the family had chickens and cows and other animals, so it actually looked like a normal ranch. On the ranch, there were trimmers, probably about 15, 20 of them. One day, the family woke up and found half of their chickens dead. They couldn't figure out what caused for them to die. About a week later, the rest of them died. The crazy thing was that there weren't any lacerations or anything. It was as if they just dropped dead. Because of that, the family decided to install cameras out in the backyard. About two months after the first incident with the chickens, it happened again to their new flock. They watched the cameras and saw an orb zip through them, and they literally dropped dead. This was in August of 2012. It was about 2 a.m., and a tremor had her head flip 360. Literally, her neck was twisted in a full circle. Everyone freaked out and scurried off. Everyone ended up finding out that she was from Laos and was here for trim season. It's obviously been years now and no one, the Laotian community, has seen her or heard of her since. She was last seen in a Thay restaurant in a restroom sucking on tampons. I'm not making this stuff up. It was all captured on video. The property had to be blessed by monks. And the land is no longer a grow operation either. For those of you that don't believe in black magic, well, that stuff is real. It's legit. Overseas, Thailand or Laos, someone must have put a spell on her and sacrificed her for who knows what reason. It's a super common thing there. 
You don't believe in that stuff until you witness or experience it firsthand. In our culture, she's known as Phi Pob. She looks human during the day, but feeds on blood and human souls. If you're legit interested in this scary stuff, look up Asian black magic and what can happen from it. I used to work on the north slope of Alaska in the oil industry. The work we were doing required us to travel far out into the Alaska Petroleum Reserve, which is basically just untamed tundra wilderness, for hundreds of miles. The oil companies would build these long ice roads in the winter that would lead to exploration drilling pads. Our job was to go out after they finished the initial drilling and test rock formations for their oil-producing qualities. It was mid-January, the sun hadn't quite come up yet. And when I say the sun hadn't come up, I mean in almost a month and a half, polar nights are intense. The particular well site we were traveling to was about 60 miles west of Alpine, Alaska, deep in the wilderness. Our job took a week, but we finished and were headed back to camp to finish our hitch and go home. At the beginning and end of the ice roads are guard shacks that you have to check in and out of for safety. No cell reception and radios work only up to a distance. If you don't check in or out in a set time, they come looking for you to ensure you're not a popsicle. It was about four in the morning, not that it mattered, in the land of endless night and we were halfway across the ice road. Travel was slow as the speed limit on the roads is only 25 miles per hour. When something appeared on the road in our headlights, it was a man in jeans, sneakers, and a hoodie jacket walking down an ice road in wilderness tundra at 4 a.m., and it was 20 degrees outside. It's not unusual for the local Inuit people to be out this far hunting. Maybe his snowmobile broke down and he's trying to get back to the guard shack. Seemed plausible. He didn't acknowledge us as our trucks rolled up next to him. He just kept shuffling forward. He didn't seem cold. His clothing, while totally not appropriate for this extreme weather, appeared warm and dry. We also noticed he wasn't Inuit, but Caucasian. I rolled down my window and asked if he needed any help and if he was okay. He still didn't acknowledge us, just kept shuffling forward. His face was completely blank, devoid of any thought or emotions. The other guys in my truck suggested that maybe he was in an accident and in shock. I continued rolling my truck alongside him as he trudged down the road, still trying to get his attention. Even in this extreme cold, I could occasionally get whiffs of a peculiar smell coming off him. He smelled acidic, if that makes sense. There was just a lot about this guy that made the hair on my neck stand up. The guy behind me in the truck's crew cab had had enough of all this. He rolled down his window and reached out to grab the guy. He later said he was just going to try and shake him out of his stupor. Before my buddy's hand could reach him, though this walking popsicle spun around and latched onto my buddy's outstretched arm. He glared at my buddy and then at me, with this look of pure rage not removing his hand from his arm. If emotions had a physical temperature, this guy could have melted the entire tundra that night. My buddy groaned in pain as he tried to get his arm free from Mr. Popcycle. At that moment, this guy starts screaming in our faces. There was so much hate and rage and anger in that scream. It was absolutely terrifying. I slammed on the gas and spun out on the ice for a second before the wheels caught and launched us forward. Popsicle dude still had a hold of my buddy's arm and was trying to pull him out of the truck. He was running alongside the truck while the other guys in the cab held on to my buddy to keep him inside. After several moments, if could only have been a few seconds at most, my buddy tore free from this guy and we hauled ass to the guard shack another thirty miles down the road. We checked in with the guards and reported what we had just seen. The guard was looking at us like we were pulling a prank, but policy said they had to check it out regardless. My buddy's arm was sore, and when he pulled back his sleeve, there were noticeable bruises in the shape of a hand around his arm. We filed a report with the guard, and we're told to head back to our camp. None of us really wanted to talk about what happened, and it was a quiet drive the rest of the way. We flew home the next day. 
The next time we saw the guard at this shack, we asked him if they ever saw Mr. Popcycle on his patrols. He told us they searched up and down that ice road for a solid 12-hour shift and saw nothing, not even tracks in the snow leading off the road. He told us it was a good prank and that he'd get us back for making him waste a shift driving around. But it wasn't a prank. Who would make up a story like that? And who would willingly bruise their arm for a dumb prank? We never got a satisfying answer to what happened that evening. I still wonder about that dude, if he even was a dude. The Alaskan tundra is a weird place, and that was just one of my many weird stories from my time up there. I'll work to write down more of my experiences and share them to the appropriate subs. I've been a park ranger here for the past few years and have been to many remote places in the park system. Plenty of backcountry camping experiences and plenty of wildlife experience. Plenty of night experiences. I am very familiar with the wilderness and the animals that occupy it. I am also familiar with the Native American culture and legends of the Native Americans, so I am very familiar with the different creatures the natives call skinwalkers. One night I was camping out in the back country of Buckhorn State Park. There are many campgrounds here in the park, but I like to camp out in the back country. There are lots of trails to hike on, lots of lakes around to explore. I was camping in the middle of the forest right near the lake. I'd hiked around the lake earlier that day and seen a lot of deer, foxes, beavers, you name it. Seeing a lot of wildlife is a good sign. So I'd been camping now for a few hours. It was nighttime. I had a fire going and was relaxing. I heard the beaver in the lake, the owls, and the usual scurrying of animals. At about 11 p.m., the forest got really quiet. I decided to try and lie down and go to sleep. I'd been sleeping in my truck, but I felt safer in a tent. When I was in my tent, I heard this owl, one owl, hooting in a very strange way. It didn't sound like a normal owl. It sounded more like a howl or a yell, almost like a human voice intermixed. I was confused that it was just one owl. I never heard an owl make such a noise before. I was curious and also kind of frightened, so I stayed awake. I would hear the noise all intermittently throughout the night, just past the lake. I never heard an owl that close to me either. It appeared like it kept getting closer, which I also thought was rather odd. Then, at about 1 a.m., I heard it again as well. And this time it was very close by, maybe 100 yards away from my tent. So, curiously, I shined my flashlight around but could not see anything. The next time I heard the owl, it was closer. There were no other noises. The night was eerily silent. I was confused. I was scared. Now it was about one thirty, and I was very tired and also scared. I heard the owl now on the other side of the lake. I kept shutting my light around but could not see anything. After some time, I just finally decided to give up and decided that that was enough. So I went back to my tent and laid down and forced myself to go to sleep. I woke up early to the sun shining in my face as I got out of my tent, and I noticed the forest was still quiet, and I noticed something else, very disturbing. Maybe no more than 30 yards away from my campsite, specifically my tent, were these large bipedal tracks. The only problem is they were not shoe or feet prints. They were large prints of a coyote. It appeared to be, and they moved from here around my tent to the lake. Well, they just seemed to stop, not to the shore, to the lake, but just stopped. I wasn't exactly sure what I should make of it. After returning back, I had heard some other stories about finding mutilated deer all in that same area, and other people talking about hearing owls hooting and being strange screaming voices, almost like it's part animal part, human. All these stories centered around Buckhorn State Park. Now, not only am I left confused, but also scared, because I believe that possibly I encountered a shapeshifter or a skinwalker, something of Native American legend. Although I can't be 100% certain, I feel like I have enough proof to back me up on this. I was a young police officer, fresh out of the academy and eager to make a difference.
So when I received the call to check something in Yosemite National Park, I didn't hesitate for a second. I packed my gear and set out early in the morning, determined to get to the bottom of whatever was going on. But as I made my way through the winding mountain roads, I quickly realized that I was lost. I pulled over and consulted my map, trying to get my bearings. But no matter how hard I looked, I couldn't seem to find my way. I was starting to panic when I heard a rustling in the bushes. I drew my weapon and cautiously approached, ready to defend myself if necessary. But as I peered into the underbrush, I saw something that sent a shiver down my spine. It was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It had the body of a human, but its skin was covered in fur and its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. I knew immediately that it was a skinwalker, a dangerous cryptid that was rumored to roam these woods. I tried to scare it off, shouting and waving my arms, but the creature just bared its teeth and lunged at me. I fired my weapon, but it was no use. The skinwalker was too fast, and before I knew it, it had vanished into the trees. I was terrified and alone, with no way to call for help. I stumbled through the woods, trying to find my way back to civilization. Eventually, I emerged from the trees and saw the faint lights of the police station in the distance. I collapsed to the ground, sobbing with relief as I called for backup. It had been the most terrifying night of my life, and I knew that I would never forget the horrors that I had encountered in the woods of Yosemite National Park. I was involved in the Boy Scouts growing up, and we went camping a few times every spring and summer. Before I aged out, we planned one more backpacking trip for a few days near a string of lakes in the mountains. We hiked there with no problem and saw many other groups along the way. A different troop of scouts settled at another lake nearby, and we went about our day, setting up camp and finding things to do in the woods. After about a day, we got news that one of the boys from the other group had gone missing and hadn't returned to camp. To make matters worse, one of their scouts had broken their arm while out searching for him and needed to leave immediately. But they all couldn't leave since. You know, one of their other scouts was missing. Search and rescue was quickly called, and by nightfall, he still hadn't been found. The other scouts moved into our camp just to keep everyone together. Searchlights from the helicopters swept over us all night and would linger over our tents, totally illuminating us. Accompanying this were rangers with search dogs coming through the camp. They searched around our entire camp, and we heard the dogs sniffing and brushing against our tents. In the morning I had heard they questioned our leaders about the kid, and if they knew anything. I just felt such a sense of dread the whole night. What if they didn't find him? They eventually found the kid after about a day, and their troop quickly packed up their things and left. But I can't help but just imagine how it would felt being lost. It was always one of my biggest fears about the wilderness. Safe to say we stuck very close together for the rest of the trip. It's why I always use the buddy system or carry something with me to make noise with. This story is unfortunately true. I have grew up in the Sierra Nevadas. I wasn't big on camping, but spent a good chunk of my childhood weekends hiking with family and friends. The summer that I was 16, about 10 years ago, now my cousin C had come back from her first year of college and her boyfriend J was visiting. J wanted to go on a hike with Lake Views and C and I knew just the one. It was one of our favorites. The three of us set off on this hike. The trail isn't the easiest to find, but it's really popular with locals because of the view and general lack of tourists. We saw a couple of other hikers, some with dogs. It is an in-and-out trail that takes about two, three hours to the top, two, three hours back down. There are some smaller trails that branch off. We make it to the top in good time and enjoy our lunches overlooking the lake. After about an hour, we hear a scream in the distance, specifically a mountain lion scream. If you've never heard a mountain lion scream, it's really unnerving. It sounds a bit like a very loud, terrified woman screaming. This is not good because when a mountain lion screams, it's part of a mating ritual. 
That means there are multiple mountain lions and close. The bears in the Sierras are softies, but the mountain lions will attack you. They'll attack your pets. They've even been known to attack bikers. Jay was really freaked out. C and I were wary, but it wasn't the first time we had heard mountain lions, and we had both seen them before. There was also an incident where, as kids, we laid out some expensive steak in my backyard in the hopes of luring a mountain lion to take pictures of it. It did not work, and my mother was unhappy about the steaks. C and I tell Jay that we need to pack it up and get back down the mountain. About forty minutes into the hike back, Jay realized that he forgot his phone at the lookout in his rush to leave, of course. We decided that C and J would hike back up to retrieve his phone and I would stay there on the trail to warn any other potential hikers that there are lions in the area. This is obviously not ideal for any of us, but seemed like the best choice at the time. I found a nice rock to sit on by the trail and was going through the pictures we took. C and J had been gone for around 50 minutes when I heard the scream again, and it's hard to tell, but I think it's closer than before. I start to freak out because being alone is not good if the lion is nearby. About 20 minutes after that, I hear the scream again, and there is now zero doubt that it's closer. Logically, I know that lions don't scream when hunting they are quiet. If a lion was hunting me, I wouldn't know it. That knowledge did not make me less scared. A couple minutes after that, I hear it again, extremely close by. I'm looking around and trying to find the best place for me to stand back, covered in case of the worst. Suddenly, I see something out of the corner of my eye. Standing still twenty feet down the trail, a couple feet off of it is a man. He's completely naked. He's filthy. He's skinny. And he's just standing there looking at me. If you don't know where you're going, it's easy to get lost in the woods around there. And it doesn't take long being alone, lacking food and water and in the wilderness to make people a little disorientated, a little crazy. My immediate response is that this man is probably a lost hiker, and judging by how dirty he was, he'd been lost a long time. He needs help. I started walking towards him, asking if he's okay. I suddenly get this feeling of wrongness. I don't know how else to describe it, but the hair stood up on my neck. I stopped in my tracks, maybe fifteen feet away now, and had the overwhelming urge to run. It seemed wrong. He looked wrong in a way I can't quite articulate. Instead of wanting to help, I'm now scared. I ask again if he's okay. He looks at me, then opens his mouth wide and screams. Not a normal scream. He screamed so loudly. Worse, it sounded just like the mountain lion. It occurred to me that we were probably hearing him the whole time. It was the single most terrifying thing I have ever witnessed. I started screaming too. Why was he just standing there screaming? Do I run? Do I get out the bear mace? Suddenly he closed his mouth, turned around, and ran into the woods very quickly. He disappeared into the trees, but the feeling of wrongness was still with me. I considered bolting down the trail, but decided to wait for C&J, who luckily arrived within ten or fifteen minutes. I told them what happened, and we decided to call it into the rangers when we got service. I've always been left with the unsettling question. Did I see a mentally ill lost hiker who really needed my help? Or did I see something, else something not human, mimicking the call of a mountain lion and stalking us down the mountain? My husband and I went camping by ourselves after being married for several years. I planned it to be mildly romantic and took our dog with us so she could get out too. Everything was wonderful until the middle of the first night. Our dog is a lab, and even though she looks like a soft, squishy animal, her growl is menacing. In the pitch black, middle of the night dark, I wake up to her growling and immediately think something is outside our tent. I panic and quietly but frantically wake my husband. There's something outside the tent. I whisper, yell at my husband as we both rummage for flashlights in our glasses. We switch on the flashlight and look outside and nothing. Our dog is still growling and snarling, so I traced her line of sight to a bug. 
some little flight-type bug that was stuck and couldn't get out. We get it out of the tent, and she goes right back to sleep. Thank goodness she saved us from that one bug and took ten years off our lives to do so. In December of 2005, me and a few high school friends were back home from our respective universities. We were juniors at the time and started a tradition winter break of freshman year to visit random state parks slash smaller towns and explore them, along with the occasional mischief that we would end up getting ourselves into. During these one-night trips, the three of us would all sleep in the back of my Tahoe on a large mattress pad. This kept us safe from the elements and set my paranoid mind at ease. Should we be subject to any foul play? We decided this year to go to the Davy Crockett National Forest area. This area has many places that are extremely rural and desolate, which was exciting because we had previously found some interesting things in abandoned structures on our previous excursions. I'd used up the rest of my university printing credits to print detailed MapQuest pages for us to use for navigation while we were visiting. The drive was roughly two hours from our hometown, Conroe. We decided to start the trip off in Lufkin, just east of the National Forest, to eat dinner and get a few things from Walmart. After dinner, we decided to mess around and get into our shenanigans. A few hours later, we found ourselves in Crockett, Texas, about an hour west of Lufkin. We planned on staying in a campground about halfway between the two cities, so had a lot of flexibility when it came to time. We explored random roads and went in a few abandoned buildings before getting bored and wanting to go somewhere else. By this time, it was 12.30 a.m. At this point in the night, I needed an energy boost, so decided to stop at a gas station in Kennard, Texas, which was about 30 minutes east of Crockett. I go inside and buy a few snacks, energy drinks, and a few cans of Skoll to give us some fuel for the rest of the night. With a nice buzz from the energy drink and Skoll going, we decided to get a little more adventurous and venture down on 357 south of Kennard. We came across a few forest service roads that ventured off into rural residential roads and other county roads. I put off on the side of the road to check MapQuest and match the cross streets we are at and give it to my other two friends to assist with navigation. After getting back onto the road, I notice it is 1.30 a.m. and we all joke about how we are miraculously are still awake. I decided to head down the next service road we came across. This is where things start to get pretty weird, and where parts of my memory are raced due to the sheer adrenaline I had at the time. After driving down a few more service roads and taking random turns, we get to a road that is much more narrow compared to the others. By this time, I get incredibly frustrated because it is almost 2.15 a.m., and I don't want to stumble into someone's front yard in a rural area in the middle of the night. I decided to slowly proceed down the road when suddenly I noticed a faint light in the distance. Great, I thought. Just great. I'm about to spook some random poor soul awake. About 30 seconds later, I can tell these are headlights, but they suddenly disappeared. I thought someone may have turned up ahead, but I was very wrong. About 10, 15 seconds later, I see what appeared to be a brand new black Chevy Suburban. The second I put my high beams on it, its lights turned on, and three men dressed in full suits jump out and sprint down the road past my car. It was almost like they were lifeless. They didn't even look at my car. As they were running past me, the Suburban suddenly shifts into reverse and conducts the fastest reverse maneuver I've ever seen. At this point, I unholster my 26 and tell my friends to grab my AR. We were all scared shitless, and I had zero clue what we were about to come up on as we drove forward. Mind you, these were the days where cell phone coverage was non-existent in many areas of this region of the state, so we had no way to call for help if something happened. As we reached the end of the road, we came upon FM 357, the same road we originated from. How was this possible, I thought? It felt like we were just venturing further and further away from that road, and we passed a used forest service fire station again on the way out, like we had on the way in, too. 
I recently checked Google Maps for any U.S. Forest Service fire station off of the FM 357 and cannot find any current or past historical data on it. The county tax assessor does not have any listings either. We got back on them 357 and decided to book it to downtown Crockett as we did not feel comfortable with sleeping in a campsite after what had just happened. I have since made sure to never venture down unknown roads without referencing GPS slash maps. I am still processing that short but unsettling event. Where did those men come from? Why were they in suits in the middle of the forest? Where did the black suburban go that vanished into the night? Me and my friends still occasionally talk about this incident, and no one can seem to come up with a found explanation. The thing that bothers me the most is I cannot find any evidence of this road we were on. Google Earth software doesn't even have a road or satellite imagery that lines up with what happened, nor does it have evidence of a fire station, or any structure for that matter. Every spring, my family spends the better part of a week camping at a nearby state park. We're all lifelong campers, so we're no strangers to the local wildlife and how to best fend them off. On our first night of this year's trip, we finished dinner and packed all the food away in the car. Not long after dark, we heard rustling in the tree line around our campground, followed, of course, by the appearance of a raccoon. We let him sniff around our picnic table, figuring if we scared him off, He'd come back, but if we let him look around and see there's no food left for him, he'd continue making his rounds to other campsites and leave us in peace. So he runs around our picnic table, stands up with his front paws on the bench, getting a better sniff of the table up above, runs off past our car towards the next campsite. Until we realized he didn't run past our car, but rather to it. We hear the quite loud and unmistakable rustling of a chip bag and go to investigate. It turns out we left the car window open, and he climbed up in there and helped himself to a bag of potato chips. He scampered off as soon as we opened the door, but not before making quite the mess. There were chip crumbs all over the seat and floor, as well as muddy little paw prints on the seat and the hood of the car. The next night, we double and triple checked that the car was all closed up. The raccoon came by again and definitely lingered at the car a bit longer than normal, but his efforts were wasted that time. In 2004, I was 15 years old, living in central Minnesota. I had hunted on my grandparents' property east of Sandstone since I was 12. It had been fairly successful each year. That season was the same as most going hunting with my dad and older brother for opening weekend and then trying to get out hunting whenever I could after that. I think it was around the second weekend when I had one of the most serious experiences of my life. On this particular day, after an unsuccessful morning hunt, my brother and I were walking back to the main house of the woods and decided to walk out to the road instead of trudging through a snowy field. Parked on the property about 40 yards off the road was a pickup truck we didn't recognize. It was abandoned, and there were tracks leading off into the woods in several directions. In the front of the dash was a pile of mail addressed to someone with a last name gamble, a name not associated with any of my family or nearby neighbors. My brother and I decided that we'd just head back home and let her dad know about it, since there was little else we could do or knew what to do. When we said the name we had seen in the window on the mail, my grandmother immediately recognized the name. Oh, that's a lady who was a few miles away from here. My dad jumped on the four-wheeler to go see if the truck was stuck or broken down and offered a help. But when he got down there a mere 20 minutes after my brother and I initially saw the truck, it was gone. Without any cause for alarm, we all basically forgot about it as we had a warm lunch and swapped hunting live stories from the morning. After a post-lunch nap, we all mapped out the morning hunting strategies and we headed out to our stands until dark. This is when the story gets good. I was sitting in my stand, lost in thought, but constantly gazing around and trying to spot movement or flashes abroad. 
I was deep in thick brush on the edge of a swamp that borders our hardwood stand on trees. It was a favorite spot for the afternoon hunts to get deer as they migrate towards the fields as it gets dark. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a flash of brown to my right. I strived to identify exactly what it was before I saw it again. It had slipped behind a pile of brush once again. I figured it'd be about fifty yards away and moving my way. I lifted my 3,030 Western Field lever action to my waist as I stood in the stand and silently slipped the safety to my off position. For several long minutes I saw and heard nothing. I began to question if I had seen anything at all, or if my imagination was finally taking over after me being fooled by squirrels for several hours, when suddenly I heard a low noise coming from the thick brush. It sounded like a growl, a growl sound. My first thought was that a wounded deer was going through its dying moments from the neighbor's property to the east. Suddenly the low growl turned into a distinct ground snarl. My mind immediately went from lurking for a wounded deer to looking for a bear. It wasn't uncommon to see bears in the area, but the thought of one being so close was both exciting and nerve-wracking to a fifteen-year-old me. The grouse grew louder and I saw the brush move slightly as the unseen bear moved closer to my stand. I placed the safety back on my weapon, but kept it at my waist. The growling stopped, and then it turned into a snarl and screaming sound that caused my heart to immediately drop in my chest in pure fear. I had never heard a bear make that sound, and I suddenly knew it was a wild cat of some sorts. The brush movement, and I finally saw the animal for the first time about thirty-five yards away. I had gone from expecting a deer to a bear to a wild cat of some sorts, and while I wasn't wrong, I did not expect in the least what I saw in front of me thirty-five yards away in the woods of Minnesota on a November day, a Bengal tiger. It had been eight feet long with orange and black stripes, a Bengal tiger. I had seen them in books and at the zoo, but I had no frame of reference for what I was witnessing. I immediately threw up my gun, turned the safety off, and cocked the hammer. My hands shook, and I thought I was going to throw up. While it was likely less than thirty seconds, I felt like I was staring in shock at the tiger for at least an hour before it snarled, screamed once more, and bounded into the woods to the north. I stood in my stand for several minutes, and so my leg shaking became paralyzing as the adrenaline wore off and the reality of what just happened came over me. I asked myself over and over if I had just seen something that was real. In my frozen fear, I contemplated shooting the apparition in front of me since it had been in my sights the entire time, but I didn't because I wasn't convinced that it was really real. I didn't have a cell phone, so contacting my brother or dad was impossible to do, but I do know one thing I did not want to be in the woods in the dark with that thing nearby. I was also less than eager to immediately get down and walk to the house with him nearby, so I sat in the stand for twenty minutes in the ready position, looking for any sign of the tiger. When I didn't see anything, I got out of my stand and started the longest walk back to the house possible. I walked the entire one slash four mile through the woods with a gun up in the ready position. Every twig breaking made me feel like a tiger was leaping towards me in the growing darkness. Needless to say, my family was skeptical when I rushed to tell the story of the evening's hunt. They believed I would seen something, but the tiger part was hard to swallow. They figured it was likely a wildcat or a mountain lion at most, but I insisted that I had seen what I would seen. Regardless, we began to get ready for Wednesday night church, and the conversation continued until we got inside the small country church. As is normal, not actually a cop myself, but I got this straight from the cop involved. So these two veteran cops, let's call them Bob and Mike, respond to a 911 that that lack details on a nicer block in a shit neighborhood of a large city. They get to the house and are met by this older woman, who was clearly an immigrant from one of the Caribbean islands, judging by her accent. She welcomes them in and politely tells them that 
She didn't make the call and alluded to having had previous issues with some of the local punk kids, so they probably made the call as a prank, so Bob is not green by any standard and is pretty well educated for a cop. Super rational guy who has faced absolute nightmares with unflappable stoicism. But damned if there isn't something about that house that's telling him to run and not look back. And there's no reason for it. The house isn't a mansion, but it's clean and well kept. The woman is annoyed about the prank call, but entirely cordial with him. There's no weird sounds or smells that suggest something is amiss. Still, he can't shake this feeling of unbridled terror. They eventually finish taking the report and leave. After they get into the car, Mike looks at Bob and says, Damned, I'm so glad to be out of there. Place freaked me the fout. Now this worries Bob more because Mike, in addition to being a veteran cop with time in the homicide department, was also some veteran of an elite military unit, his name entirely escapes me at the moment, an all-around badass, that they both were independently freaked out was bizarre. Still, it's a big city and they have other stuff to worry about so they get back to work. But leaving that feeling unaddressed didn't sit well with Bob. When he was on his own and had nothing pending, he went back to that neighborhood and found the block captain. Pro tip, if you want to know the details in a specific area, find the block captain. So he asks her, hey, you know, that islander lady on your block? The captain says, oh, you mean the witch? And Bob is just like what? Remember those kids that were giving the homeowner a hard time? Apparently one of the local punks threw a rock at her window not too long ago, before Bob and Mike visited. This shit, let's call him punk, basically acted like an asshole prick when the woman confronted him. Witnesses say she swore he would regret it. That very night, Punk's parents rush him to the local hospital, which is actually a really phenomenal hospital despite the neighborhood. He's in massive pain for apparently no reason. The ER runs tests, he's in multiple organ failure, and they have no idea why. None of their tests showed any reason why a previously healthy teenager was just dying in front of them. Nothing poisonous, no injuries, etc., the staff valiantly worked to stabilize him, but nothing was working. At last, the parents went to the homeowner's place, throw themselves in front of her door, and beg her to spare their son. The homeowner supposedly looked at them with an oddly neutral face and said their son would be fine. Sure enough, for no reason that the hospital staff could fathom, Punk does a complete 180 during the night. All his organs start working again. He stabilizes and is back to 100% come morning. There isn't even any permanent damage to his previously imperiled organ. Bob later confirmed at least Punk's mysterious illness and equally astounding recovery. Bob's contact was totally creeped out when he told her about the homeowner. Just today, my friend and I were hiking on some abandoned and unused land. It's really beautiful with lakes, cliffs, and tons of trees. The hike was going really well, but close to dark, it turned around. My friend whispered to me that they had been thinking of skinwalkers and couldn't stop. This got me thinking of the same, and we decided to head back to the car to eliminate any risk. A few minutes into the hike back, we both got horrible feelings, and it became apparent that we were not alone. We kept making our way back to the car as fast as we could, but it kept getting worse. Both of us experienced blurred vision, and the air suddenly got thick and had a hum to it. It also became incredibly hard to move, and we both experienced an intense urge to lay down and stop hiking. We came across an area we hadn't yet hiked through, but was adjacent to there we were and there were so many deer prints in every direction, as if a deer had been rapidly pacing there, and human footprints on the other side of that scramble. There wasn't a clear starting point to the footprints, and no evidence of other hikers for miles. The trek back to the car seemed to take five minutes and three hours simultaneously, so we have no clue how long it took. Neither of us has felt thin sense of dread or been this disoriented before. Do you think we had a close encounter with a skinwalker, or was it something else entirely? I do not have the background knowledge to say what exactly it could be. 
We're in eastern Kansas, if that helps. Any information or ideas are appreciated. Note I'm not trying to offend anyone in my story. I am simply telling the events that I experienced. My friend was thinking of skinwalkers, and I am simply looking for advice or ideas as to what I could have experienced. Whatever it was, it was very scary and not a good experience. I said in my post that I did not have the knowledge or experience to claim it to be anything specific, and I hoped that doing so would clarify that I was not trying to offend anyone. Thank you to all who have given ideas or canned criticism of my wording. I really appreciate all of it. This is a story I heard from a guy I worked with in the Air Force while stationed at Asun, a B in South Korea, in 2003. He said that when he was at his first duty station in Germany, about ten years previous, he and another airman were rooming together in this small basement apartment off base. One night he wakes in his tiny room to see a dark shadow person standing in front of his window. He jerks fully awake, and they're gone. The thing is that the bed is actually pushed against that window, so there isn't room for a person to stand. He assumes he was dreaming, but is too rattled to go back to sleep. So after tossing and turning for hours, he gives up and gets up. Same thing happens the next night. So he risks ridicule and asks his housemate if they'd been in his room the previous night around 3 a.m. The answer was no accompanied by ridicule. This happens to him every night for the next two weeks at 3 a.m. Eventually, it doesn't really shock him anymore. He sees the guy, tries to focus on him. It disappears. He knows he won't sleep, so he gets up around 3.15, makes coffee, watches TV until time for work. So one morning, usual routine. He's just sitting down on the couch with coffee in hand when a fireball shoots out of the stove that heats the apartment and ignites a dried-up houseplant a couple feet away. He jumps up and puts the fire out by throwing the plant in the bathtub, and he was never bothered by the dark shadow again. Camping in the Wichita Mountains, National Wildlife Refuge. Perhaps not as impressive as some of the stuff I've seen on this sub, but for us it was a great camp. Here the creaking of the cooler opening figured it was some asshole from another campsite stealing our beer. Throw my headlamp on and I try to get out of my tent as fast as I can. Air IFN raccoons had opened up the cooler and stolen our hot dogs. I followed the paw prints in the dirt back to an empty package of Hebrew Nationals and shelled out for Mears Burgers the next night. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean, on an icebreaker boat, we were steaming south and I had one of the night watches on the bridge. I was a key M. Anyone who has been on a ship at night knows almost all lights are out so your night vision can adjust. Read it is really dark on the bridge at night. I was leaning against the chart table facing aft, talking to two other watchstanders a few feet in front of and facing me. Suddenly I was looking at them as if it was noon on the sunniest day. I jumped past them and out onto the flying bridge to try to see what was happening. What appeared to be perfectly round, incredibly bright, yellowish orb was passing over us from east to west. It looked and felt like it was just barely above the ship and it was moving fast. There was no noise. I watched until it went beyond the horizon waiting for the explosion or crash when it hit the water. Nothing. The darkness that followed after its passing was incredible. From first seeing the light until it disappeared couldn't have been more than ten seconds horizon to horizon. At that time, the phones on the bridge lit up with reports from all over the ship. Everybody described more or less the same sight. Some called it a meteor, some a flare, some a UFO. There were no surface contacts on radar, and this object wasn't either, but we initiated a search pattern in case it was a flare. I checked all pertinent notice to mariners looking for notice of rocket launches, live firing exercises, or similar, but found nothing that would explain it. This was in 1990 or so, and as far as I know, none of us who were on the ship ever found out for sure what we saw.
I was solo camping in a state park campground on a spring weekday, so there were not many people in the campground. I had just gotten in my tent to read a bit before bed when I heard this weird, almost simian howling. Up in the Pacific Northwest, my first thought was Sasquatch. Even though I don't really believe being alone in the woods will make you reconsider your beliefs pretty quick, the howling got closer until it was right outside my tent, and then a second set of howls started up in the distance. When I got to cell service in the morning, I looked it up and found out it was most likely a barred owl, but it had me pretty freaked out in the dark alone. So I'm not a cop, but when I was a kid, my mom had to call them on two occasions, and here's why. When I was five, we moved into a home, built in 1840, and remodeled it. Lots of weird stuff would happen, and while renovating the kitchen, we even found human remains. Yes, they were reported and collected, but we never heard back. Anyway, when I was about 13, I was at a friend's house for the night. My mom was in the living room below my bedroom, and she heard what sounded like someone trashing my bedroom, smashing out my window, and jumping onto the roof of the front porch. She naturally called the police, and nothing was touched. No one could explain what happened. Another night, I was asleep in my room, and my dog started growling, which woke me up. When I woke up, it sounded like all the drawers downstairs were being thrown open, and glass was breaking. I also heard boots walking. This was before cell phones, and I just tried to keep my dog quiet. I gave him a bone, and I army crawled to my brother's room down the hall. He was awake and heard it, too. He got his baseball bat and went into my mom's room, and she already had 911 on the line. The police arrived and heard the noises from outside the house. Once again, no signs of forced entry. Nothing moved. There was also fresh snow on the ground and no abnormal steps outside. A lot happened in that house, but these were the two times the law was involved, and no one could explain anything. I, uh, then 25F, went solo camping with my Labrador. I set up my tent at the edge of the forest, and everything was fine. In the middle of the night, I heard footsteps around my tent, and someone tried to open the zipper. Luckily, I always secured the zipper with a suitcase lock. My dog, who has never been aggressive, completely freaked out and looked like he was ready to kill anyone if necessary. I think that was also the reason why the person then left. I couldn't sleep the rest of the night, and at dawn I packed up and drove the three hours back home. We were camping out of a canoe in rural Missouri and had a run-in with a mountain lion. It followed us a couple miles down the river in the adjoining woods, and we finally had to set up camp on the shore because it was getting dark. Middle of nowhere with no cell service and too far to float to the next resort. Our dog was a puppy at the time and could tell something was nearby and spent most of the time hiding. In the middle of the night, something charged the side of the tent and took up two tent stakes. I have no idea how we didn't get eaten that night. Maybe the sound of us freaking out scared it away. We went jungle-slash-mountain hiking once and camped near the summit around 2,000 miles. I walked away from our tents for a wee and realized I had chosen a small brook as my toilet spot. All of a sudden, on my right ear, I thought I really heard a whisper spoken in my native language say, this is not good. I could swear I could feel the breath on my neck, but there was absolutely no human around. I was also wide awake as my adrenaline was pumping as I was already too scared to stray away from camp. I still think a lot about that time and believe mountains are sacred. I was working early one morning on a Wednesday. At that time, I'd been a police officer for a little over ten years. I was in a good mood that morning because I was expecting some potentially good news about an upcoming promotion. In fact, everyone was in a good mood that morning. 
I was eager to do my job and go home to my family. My day changed dramatically when the phone rang, though. It was an old friend of mine, and she had called me directly. She sounded exhausted and a little incoherent. When I asked her what was going on, she explained that she hadn't been sleeping. We'll call her Megan for this story. Megan told me that she'd been waking up every night from sounds coming from the basement of her house. At first she assumed it was rats or skunks or something, but then she said the previous night. The noises had gotten so loud that she was certain there was a person sleeping in her basement. Reports like that are never good to hear. It's a surprisingly common event where vagrants will break into someone's basement and live there for weeks on end, stealing from them and causing all kinds of damage. The real danger is if someone gains access to the main house. Megan lived alone at the time, so I immediately agreed to come over and take a look. I wanted to make sure that whatever was happening in her basement would come to an end. She asked me to come later as she was going to work. It sounds odd, but she wanted me to hear what she was hearing. She said that the sounds never happened in the daytime, so if I came over at night, then perhaps I could catch the person, if it even was a person that was living in her basement. I agreed, but it left me feeling uneasy and concerned all day. That evening, she let me know when she was on her way home, and I went to meet her at her house. She offered to cook me dinner while we waited for the sounds to start back up. I was in an even better mood, as I had learned by that point that I'd gotten the promotion that I was after. So we had a little celebration. At around 10.30, I heard the first sound coming from downstairs. She stopped and told me to press my ear to the door. So I did. I could hear a fair amount of shuffling. It wasn't very clear what it was, but it was definitely too big to be a rat or a skunk. I told her that I was going to slowly open the door. But when I did, it made a loud sound that I could hear crashing in the basement. I ran down the stairs with my weapon drawn, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I switched the light on. What I found was what looked like a large nest of some kind. There were branches and feathers and dried leaves all piled together in the center of the room, and it stank like nothing I'd ever smelled before. The window was broken, so whoever it was had left. I told her to stay at my house for a few nights and then arranged for some trail cams to be put up in the basement so that we could catch whoever was down there and have sufficient evidence. After a few days, I went to retrieve the trail cams and watch the footage. Megan was sitting next to me at the time. What I saw completely blew my mind. A large animal with long, thin arms and legs climbed in through the window. It behaved similar to a large ape, only I'd never seen an ape like that before. It brought with it more items to add to the nest. I know for a fact that apes don't make nests. In fact, most animals of that size don't make nests. It walked on its two hind legs like a human, but was hunched over the entire time. It had a large rib cage and large ape-like hands, but I remember noting that it had no ears and seemed to have no color on its skin, apart from one large black spot on the back of its head. Megan was freaking out and asking me what to do. I had no answer, for I'd never encountered anything like that before. So I gave the footage to my superior. When he watched it, his eyes stretched wide. The next thing I knew, I had a non-disclosure agreement on my desk, and the footage was confiscated from my possession. Megan was also forced to sign so that she couldn't speak of it. She said that men with suits had come into her basement, and when they were done, there was nothing left and her entire basement had been boarded up. She never really felt safe in her home, though, and wound up selling it a few months later. It was a sad day, as that home had been in her family for generations, but whatever security she once felt there had been stripped away by whatever creature had decided to nest there. I was a ranger in St. Louis County, Minnesota. The year was 2007. A man in our staff went missing during his lunch break. He was a husband and father. We sent a search party out to locate him. We searched the area for about a day or so, but he was nowhere to be found. We even made inquiries to other nearby towns, but they had no information. We assumed he had wandered away from the area and may have perished. The family of this man requested his remains be found and buried. We honored this request. 
We had several months go by, and we put this man behind us. Then a strange occurrence happened one early evening in the fall. I was out on patrol, running radar on the roads. I was about two miles north of town, which is a rural area. I was doing my rounds, and I spotted a pair of eyes in the ditch. I thought it was a fox or something. I stopped my vehicle, stepped out. I wasn't expecting what I saw next. A dark, shadowy figure became now visible. It was hunched over, finishing off a deer. This deer was a simple four-point buck. The thing had just been killed and was eating it. That's not all. I was shocked at what followed. It stood back up, this thing on two legs, walking upright. It looked me in the eyes and quickly disappeared. The eyes were blood red. I watched this thing walk off into a nearby creek and disappeared immediately. I went back to the office and called my boss and told him when I saw him. He told me to stay there until he could get there. So I sat there staying in the office while my boss and another ranger wrote down everything they could about what I had to say. They searched for a few hours but could not find anything. I was scared to go out on patrol the next few days. It only happened one or two more times after this, and even then, that's probably too much. I ended up seeing it again in the area where I first saw it. It never acted aggressive, but it was always in that area. The final time it was winter and there was about 12 inches of snow on the ground. I saw it again. This was the last time. I was relieved when the spring came and I did not have to patrol that section any longer. Now, before I end my story, let me quickly tell you why I included the first part about the man missing after lunch. I believe that his spirit became disembodied and turned into this horrible, ghastly apparition that I saw, or otherwise known as a Wendigo. I believe that it's possible that his spirit, or him dying, turned into this creature that I saw. Of course, this is just a wild theory, but I cling to it because it makes sense to me. I would love to hear any comments or thoughts or even theories on what they think. Do you believe that he turned into a Wendigo? Is it possible that he died and his spirit was able to manifest as this being? I don't know. I worked as a police officer in the town of Nakagoshi's for around eight years. I loved it there. A lot of people don't see why I enjoyed it so much, but that town had really brought me peace after many rough years. That peace was completely disrupted one day, though. There are many trails in Nakagoshi's. Most of them are completely tucked away in thick trees and brush. It was my day off, and walking those trails was one of my favorite things to do. At the time I had been divorced, I'm ashamed to admit that I wasn't a very good father in those years. I hadn't seen my children in years, and I had made very little effort to be part of their lives. It's a terrible thing to admit to, and I have many regrets, but that's the kind of man I was at the time. I had picked out my trail for the day. It was one that I hadn't walked yet, and I decided I'd go exploring. For some reason that day my children were on my mind, I remember that it bothered me because it made me feel guilty. It was kind of a bummer to feel that guilt on my day off. In hindsight, I was probably thinking about them because some part of me knew that I was in imminent danger. The first thing I noticed was that the trail was very quiet, seemed unusual. Normally, I'd come across at least one other person while on my walks. That day, I hadn't seen a single other soul. It didn't bother me too much, but it did tell me that I needed to be more vigilant for snakes and other dangerous creatures. I had stopped for a drink of water, and I was leaning against the wooden rail that lined the trail, when all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I hate that feeling so much. I don't really know why it happens to us, but it's never a good sign. I lowered my water bottle and listened carefully for any kinds of sound. I couldn't hear anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly the space around me felt way too quiet. I looked toward the direction I was going as I contemplated whether or not I should carry on with the trail or head back towards my car. I made the logical decision to head back towards my car. It wasn't far along the trail, so I knew it wouldn't take long to get to safety. 
As I walked, the only sound I could hear was the sound of my own footsteps, and it completely unsettled me. Then, something stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a light thudding sound, and it was coming from high up in the trees. I stopped to look. I scanned the trees, but heard and saw nothing. I decided to stay where I was for just a moment and listen. Then I heard the thought again, just to my left. It was as if something had landed in the tree. I looked up at the tree, which was covered in red and orange leaves. I focused hard on the leaves, searching for a large bird or maybe a squirrel. Then slow movement caught my eye. Something massive was stalking me. I couldn't see it clearly, but it had long limbs and it climbed through the branches sideways. It seemed to be keeping me in its sights as it moved gently through the leaves, barely rustling the branches. Then I saw part of its face. Two saucer-like eyes stared at me from between the branches. It seemed like minutes that we stared at each other. Not once did the creature blink. It seemed to be patiently waiting for me to look away. I was frozen with fear. I could hear nothing but the sound of my heart beating in my chest. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, more hikers stumbled upon me. They were noisier than I was. They had a Bluetooth speaker that was pumping loud hip-hop music, and they were laughing and joking. It scared the creature away. It took off along the trees, moving faster than any animal I had seen before. Those other hikers will never know that their obnoxious behavior had saved my life that day. All I remember thinking was that I was going to die without ever seeing my children grow up. As soon as I got back to my car, I phoned my kids. That experience changed my life for the better. Still, I never want to be that scared again. It was a typical morning in Yellowstone National Park when the body of park ranger John was found. He had been on patrol the night before, but never returned to his post. The other rangers searched for him and eventually found him in a remote area of the park. But something was off. John's skull was missing, and his body had been brutally attacked. My name is Jack, and I'm one of the park rangers. I was tasked with analyzing the body and trying to figure out what could have caused such a gruesome death. As I examined the wounds, I couldn't help but think that they looked like they had been made by a large, sharp claw. I couldn't shake the feeling that this was the work of a creature similar to Bigfoot. I shared my findings with the rest of the park rangers, but they mocked me and said I was just seeing things. They reported the case as a murder to the police, but they said they were too busy to investigate. I was left alone with a body, and I knew I had to find out the truth. I decided to take matters into my own hands and ventured into the woods. I wanted to see if I could find any clues or evidence that would support my theory. As I walked deeper into the forest, I heard a loud roar in the distance. I froze in place, unsure of what to do. But then I saw it. A creature, unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was covered in fur had a large, sharp claw, and stood at least eight feet tall. The creature roared again, and a buck ran past me, panicked. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was like something out of a nightmare. The creature then fled into the woods, and I was left standing there, in shock. I knew I had to tell the others what I had seen, but I didn't know if they would believe me. I was terrified and didn't know what to do. I eventually made it back to the ranger station and I told them everything. But they still didn't believe me. They thought I was just seeing things, or that I was losing my mind. I was left feeling alone and isolated. I knew there was a creature out there that had killed John, and I was the only one who knew about it. I couldn't shake the feeling that the creature was still out there watching me. I knew I had to be careful, and I couldn't let my guard down. I was determined to find the truth and bring justice for John, but I couldn't shake the feeling of dread that followed me, knowing that I was the only one who knew the true horror that lurked in the woods of Yellowstone National Park. I'm a Coast Guard, old Navy tug brought into service to the Usty S. Creeker. 
had a ghost of a Navy guy who died in the bilge from gas. Fast forward to a new used mechanic trying to fix one of the batteries and wasn't getting it quite right. A guy on the batter next to him said, No, you do it like this, and unscrewed a part, showing him how it was done. However, the other guy was in a Navy uniform, and we were at sea. He diapered shortly after talking. Lots of us had seen that Navy engineer in the past, but that particular coast eye got off the boat at the next port call and refused to reboard. We left without him, not sure whatever happened, but he never came back to the ship. We also had the screams of a lady that would happen during late shifts, enough that we always turned the boats aft away from the direction of the screams in case it was a civilian in the water. No woman aboard this ship. We would light up that section of ocean with high-powered lighting, but there was never anything there. We were told not to log the events. One time we paddled into a backcountry site that we like camping at in the fall. It's high on a rocky cliff, but has natural stairs up, so it's nicely protected from the wind and damp of the lake. One day we were walking around in the woods behind the site just to see what we see. There are lots of open spaces caused by exposed rock that create a natural trail. We weren't even that far from the site. All of a sudden we hear a short, low growl. We freeze. Neither of us were sure we actually heard it. We wait a minute, see and hear nothing, so we start walking again. A longer growl. Now the hair is standing up on the back of my neck. My instinct is to run, but I don't want to activate some animal's prey drive. We still don't see anything. My husband picks up a big stick and starts hitting trees and making lots of noise so we seem big. We slowly back away and walk calmly back to our campsite. Needless to say, we didn't sleep much that night. We never saw what it was, but our theory is that it was a coyote. We often hear them howling and yipping near there, and I've read they sleep in the open during the day. We pull into a state park campground to camp for a couple of nights. There was a line of trees separating our campsite from our neighbors, and our neighbors had a strap strung up between two of the trees with two blackened sausages hanging from hooks. Trying to ignore how weird that is, our neighbors greet us and say, Don't worry about the sausages. Our buddy got a trail camera, so we're trying to catch raccoons with it. Glossing over the fact that this trail cam was pointed right into our campsite. I definitely had to keep this in mind when I got out of my camper to pee in the middle of the night. The sausages were still there the next morning. But I think eventually a ranger came by and told them to cut it out because they disappeared sometime during the day. I didn't like the weird vibes emanating from that spot, so we just ignored their presence for the most part. They were gone for most of the day, but came back to their enormous RV and generator right as we were thinking it would be peacefully quiet for the rest of the evening. The last morning, I wake up to the sound of a thousand crows circling us. I lay there for a while and then peek out and see a dead crow lying right in the same precise spot below where those black sausages had been hanging the day before. Every crow within a 100-mile radius was circling overhead, angrily cawing out during this crow funeral. Now, I've been on the wrong side of a crow war before, so I wasn't too interested in any of them recognizing me. We packed up our camp as quickly as we could and hit the road. It took moving 1,000 miles away to finally feel comfortable enough to tell you this story. This happened just before my senior year of high school over a period of three weeks in the summer. I was 17 years old, drug-free and sober. At the most, I took Advil for headaches every now and again. I just want to assure you I was not on any mind-altering substances or long-term medication that could affect my cognitive ability. During the summer, my curfew was 11 p.m., and this occurred while driving home from my, at that time, boyfriend's house, which took roughly 15 minutes. So let's say about 10, 45 at night. I was full of energy at this age and a night owl, so I was not even remotely tired. 
In fact, I was hyped up with a warm summer nighttime breeze. Car windows down, singing along to the radio. I took a shortcut through back roads to avoid going into the tiny city with its jerk cops. Also, one of the roads I took was super straight and flat so I could really speed. And that feels great when you're a teenager. But right before that road, I had to take two very close turns to get onto it. First, I'd take a right turn that was more than 90 degrees almost back the way I head came. Then, in exactly half a mile, I would turn left onto the long, straight road where I could really put the gas pedal down. Since it was only half a mile, I normally didn't speed up that much because the small stretch of road was more like packed gravel than it would be a waste. As I would have to slow down again to turn left onto the much better road where I could let loose. The tiny property on the inside corner of the left turn is where all this went down. A house had recently been built there. Two stories with a detached garage, and it seemed odd how quickly it had been erected as we built our family house, and it took us a year to finish it. I will start at the beginning because I believe this is all related. Week one. I am positively jamming to my music. The wind whipping through my car feels great and I'm relaxed in my very familiar drive home. I slow down to make my right turn onto the rough rural road, just be bopping along, when my lights illuminate something stunning sitting on the corner of the road. It's a wolf, a real wolf, a solid white real wolf. I know the difference in my dog breeds and a wolf. I love watching dog competitions, wildlife documentaries, and have even met a one-slash-fourth wolf in person. They look different from domestic dogs. This was a wolf, and it was amazing and blowing my mind. I slow down even more while I turn down my music. I'm getting close to it, and I, I notice that it's not minding me at all. It is sitting perfectly still on the corner of the road, staring at the house. Almost unblinking, its ears didn't even flick towards me. All its attention was focused on this house. I was so close I could have reached out my window and brushed the fur on the back of its head. I was smiling and amazed, but my mind was already churning. It made no sense for a wolf to be behaving like that, even less for there to be a white wolf in rural North Alabama in the summer. I came to a complete stop behind it, marveling at its fur and presence. I felt euphoric like I had seen something rare and blessed. My mind made a jump to the local Indian stories of animal spirit guardians, and I started to wonder. I couldn't stay, though. Mom would never believe me if I told her I was late because of a spirit wolf. With a sigh, I said goodbye to the wolf and drove home in a better mood than ever. I got to see something special, and it filled me with emotions of joy and peace. Week two. I was driving home again, and I had been taking extra care to keep an eye out for my wolfy buddy, hoping to see him again around that area, so I drove extra slow with my window down and radio off. That was a horrible mistake. I should have realized what the presence of a guardian meant. It meant danger. Alas, I was on the short road approaching the new little house. Then I saw the thing that to this very day makes me question my sanity. My reality and possibility of eldritch terrors, as Lovecraft described. It was crouched right before their mailbox, its limbs folded and pulled in tight with its hunched posture, yet its head was still taller than the box. It was mottled green and black with undertones of blue, and it looked wet and slimy all over. Its head was elongated, allowing for an extended maw full of razor-sharp teeth. The upper half of its body looked emaciated with barely more than frog-like thin skin pulled over angular long bones, ropey muscles to hold it upright, and at the end of its grossly stretched arms were equally terrible long fingers. While its legs had bulked to them and looked equipped for running with back-facing knees for sprinting and tipped in raptor-like curved claws, it looked tall, maybe seven foot, maybe more, just folded up into this predator's posture, waiting for prey. Then there were its eyes, solid, black, and sunken. I still want to vomit thinking about its eyes looking at me. Then I realized, it's going to look at me, it's going to see me, and there is no avoiding it. Panic 
terror unique to this alien thing swallowed me instantly, feeling like I was tilting off the world I had always known and into an abyss where monsters like this exist. I couldn't breathe, but I had to get my window up. I had to get my window up or I'd be ripped by those teeth and torn with those claws. Blood would adorn the cabin of my car, and I would become an unsolved mystery. I had a manual crank window. F me, I had a crank window because I was scared of crashing into water and not being able to get out of my car, but now I realize that there were far worse things in the world than crashing into water. Its head was turning towards me, and I had let off the gas, but I was still getting closer to it. It made me want to scream, but I had to get my window up first, and I was cranking it as hard as I could. I was starting to cry as I finally got the window closed, and then I put my gas pedal to the floor. Gravel road be damned. I thought I must not look at it as I pass. I must not look at it or make direct eye contact. I just shouldn't. It's not good to connect with these things. I've already seen too much. My tires had found grip, and I started to launch forward, passing it. In my peripheral vision, I could see it starting to unfold its limbs, and it sent a terrible chill down my spine. I'm screwed. I'm really screwed. I'm really screwed. I was mumbling through my tears as I slid around the turn, fishtailing for a moment before I rocketed down the road. I felt sick. My heart was hammering. I had snot and tears rolling down my face, and my hands were shaking. I glanced in my rearview mirror and could only see darkness as there were no street lamps out there. I used a trick I've mentioned in one of my other stories to tap my brake soft enough the light comes on, but I don't actually slow down. Red lit up the dust that was billing up in my wake, but amidst the swirling chaos I thought I saw a darker shadow than the rest. I had enough and decided I was going to drive straight to the lighted roads and not let off the gas again the rest of the way. No more looking back. I was going to drive 100 nanium, which is as fast as I can go, before my governor kicks in. I even ran a stop sign at the end of the road because I was not going to get caught by this thing if I could help it. I took a right onto the highway and flew home. I might have even been relieved to get pulled over, but I did not. When I got home, no one was awake. I was pretty trusted to come home on time, so I called my boyfriend and cried to him for a long time before I was able to explain. He was dismissive and thought I was pulling a joke on him. Then he thought I was just being crazy and seeing things. There's many reasons we didn't stay together, but his insensitivity contributed. Week three. I refused to take my shortcut anymore. For that reason, I would have to leave my boyfriend's house a bit early, and he'd been making fun of me about it all week. One of the days we went to a park to walk around, and on the way back, he decided he wanted to drive by the house where I saw that thing. I was hysterical, begging him not to drive there, but he would not be dissuaded, so as we got closer and I could not stop him, I leaned my passenger side seat all the way back and pulled myself down, cowering in panic of getting near the place. I hid below the window and covered my eyes while panting heavily, reliving the traumatic night in my mind again. At one point he stopped the car. Spooky, you have to see this, he said. No, I whined, resisting him, pulling at my arm. No, you really have to see this look, he said in a changed tone of astonishment. Tears in my eyes, I uncurled and slowly peeked over the rim of the window. The house was gone, burnt clear down to the foundation with only a handful of framing beams still standing. The ground around the house was blackened in a perfect large circle. My boyfriend started to get out of the car. I shouted to get out of here. Well, I grabbed for his arm, but he easily avoided me and got out. He walked around the ashy piles of the ruins for a bit, using a stick to poke at this and that. When he finally came back, he had an intense look of thinking on his face. There was no evidence of any personal belongings, furniture, power wiring, or even interior walls. It doesn't seem like other burnout houses. Something's weird. When we got to his house, he searched for news articles about any house fires in the area. There weren't any. He called the closest fire station and was quickly brushed off by the person that answered as they didn't know about a fire there and didn't have time to find out before quickly hanging up on him. I never wanted to see that place again. I went out of my way to avoid the roads in that area. 
talking about it still makes my chest tighten, my skin crawl, and my eyes water. My brain still has trouble because I know I saw it, a thing that is nothing like any creature known to humans, yet still I saw it. If you've heard of something that matches its description, let me know. So when I was in high school, my friends and I were into really spooky shit that we had no business messing around with. We would visit cemeteries at night, go to our small town's local haunt spot, to try to stir up any urban legends. But the story I'm about to tell made us quit cold turkey trying to seek out the paranormal. One night, we were over at our friend's century-old home. I mean, it was old and creaky and the perfect setting for a night of Oija. We brought it out, and for the first half hour, nothing insane happened. Just some movement from the planchette. Then, feeling smug, I asked the spirits what my middle name was. The thing is, my middle name is literally made up by my parents. It's not a real name. No one in the circle knew, let alone could spell my middle name. There was literally no way someone could even guess it. But the board knew. It spelled my middle name perfectly, and I could feel my heart fall into my gut. Keep in mind, my hands were not on the planchette, so I couldn't have moved it myself. Everyone laughed, because what a silly middle name that would be. But I had to confess that it was mine, and the color drained from everyone's face. All of a sudden, a glass ashtray that was sitting a few feet away on the coffee table split clean in two, and we were done. We left the house to go stay somewhere else. I walk outside. It's the kind of dark when it's too early for morning still, but too late for night and it's freakishly quiet outside. I thought nothing of it at the time. Our trash cans were located on the side of the house in the backyard, halfway to the gate. If you stood at the side of my house looking towards the gate, you would see a hedge to the left of the gate that goes up to your waist. Across the street is another house with a driveway light installed. The light gives off that blaring white security light. Anyway, I get to the trash can to throw away the junk. When I look over towards the gate, that's when I saw it, whatever it was. I could only see the outline of it because the blaring white security light was in my eyes but it was the most smooth and round head I've seen, which connected to very slouched shoulders. At first I didn't know what I was looking at, just an odd shape, the same height of the hedges. It wasn't until it moved silently and slowly towards the bottom of the hedge and to the neighbor's yard that I saw it looked headish. I was fourteen at the time and just stood there waiting for more movement or sound. After about one minute, yeah, I waited. Of not hearing anything, I sprint back towards the kitchen door. I don't know what it was or why it moved so silently, but it wasn't much longer before we moved out of that house due to strange things. But that's a story for another time, or at least another post. So to start off, I grew up on a small farm surrounded by forest. It's a small town below a major city in Appalachia. The first incident with this entity was probably when I was maybe 8-10, so 10-13 years ago. I was in my bedroom at home listening to music and playing. My window was open and it was evening getting dark, but I could still see outside. I noticed my dad walking by the window stone-faced. I was going to say hello to him, but decided not to. Later, I mentioned to my mom that I saw Dad pass my window. She informs me that my dad wasn't home. In any way, my window was too high up for my dad to have been at that height. Mom decides it was probably a bear. We had a lot of hunting dogs that very often would freak out over nothing, but at the time of seeing what I thought was my dad, they weren't upset. I've mentioned this to my significant other before, and my friends and I were talking about our strangest moments, and significant other tells me to tell them that story, but then tells me he saw something similar when we were visiting my dad in his peripherals. He said it looked like a very tall person, but didn't see specific details, but that it walked past the large kitchen window. He meant to tell me earlier, but honestly forgot. It's really weird, and... 
I'm not sure what else to think about it, but since my significant other told me he saw it too, I've been trying to research what it might be. I've also just felt creeped out at the thought of going to my dad's again. I've had other weird experiences that I'm not sure what to think of, such as going hiking and finding small shacks in the middle of the woods that are my dad's property, then not finding them again, and my mother calling me from outside while I was playing and telling me she heard screaming, thinking it was me and couldn't see me in the yard and thought a wild animal could have grabbed me. Not sure if they're related, but figured I'd add that. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.